of Ancient Council, Northern Ireland, to establish uh, its fit for purpose. Um, members, obviously serious concerns in relation to this correspondence. Uh, the Department of Education advised the Committee for Education that it would legislate this mandate in order to uh, address shortcomings in uh, the legislation in respect of the varies of the General Teaching Council, but no legislation has been forthcoming to date. Would members agree that we invite the Department of Education to give an update briefing on the General Teaching Council and the legislation required regarding its varies? We could also ask the Northern Ireland Teaching Council to attend to elaborate on their correspondence as well. Would members agree with that approach? Agreed, Thatcher. Agreed. Okay, thank you, members. Agenda item 2.2, members, is correspondence tabled in respect of the Department of Education's response regarding the experience of LGBT uh, pupils in school. The response notes that relevant provisions of the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act, NI 2016, have not yet been commenced. Would members agree that the committee seek a, a briefing on the delay in commencement of these provisions and an update on uh, education legislation on this matter generally. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. 2.3 members, I believe you will all have received a survey about teaching of computer studies and coding in primary schools. Uh, it's tabled at item uh, point three. To assist the correspondent, would you agree that we ask the Department of Education and Education Authority uh, to provide us with a substantive reply to the questions raised? Agreed, appreciate Agreed. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, then, members, I'd also like to raise the issue of school restart. Um, I, I, for the record, asked the Education Minister to give an oral statement on school restart to the assembly yesterday. Uh, regrettably, this request was declined. Uh, and I have to say, uh, and I said this to the, the minister as well, um, openly and honestly, that uh, ministry by media is, whether it's broadcast, print or social media, is doing children, parents and education staff no justice whatsoever. I am aware that there is an, edu an executive meeting on Thursday, um, but I think when significant announcements are made in relation to school restart, that really the education minister ought to be giving uh, an oral state statement to the assembly to give an opportunity to set that plan out in with clarity uh, and, and also to provide accountability for the, the rationale uh, taken by way of responding to questions from members that regrettably um, has not taken place yet. Hopefully, um, it can do in due course. Members want to comment that in any shape or form, or content to note. Can I? Can I? Sorry, sorry. Let me bring in Pat, and then I'll, I'll take uh, any other members as well. Pat. Yes, Chair. It's been very disappointing over the last day or two. Some of the commentary that's been taking place in the media. I mean, the executive met last week uh, and agreed a position. Uh, and then the First Minister came out night before last, <coughs> calling for that decision to be revisited, uh, going on a solo run, trying to change policy on the hoof, and all because England decided that they were going to send all their schools back. I mean, it, it, it beggars belief, in my view, that anyone would want to follow the English model, given how abysmally they have handled this whole pandemic. And given the fact that the chief medical officer uh, as recently as last week said that the return of uh, schools in their entirety would raise the R number by between 0.3 and 0.7%. At the moment, the R numbers uh, said to be between 0.7 7 and 0.8. Even if we only uh, reach that lower number of 0.3, it still puts us back over the, the one again uh, and creates the same problems that we have been trying to emerge from recently. Uh, so, I mean, 
I don't know what others feel about that, but I just think it sends a completely wrong signal out to to school children, to their parents, and, and to teaching staff in general. Uh, so I, I just think it's it's it, it's a terrible thing to be doing. That's okay. Thanks, Pat. Um, someone else indicate they wanted to speak? Yep, Chair. Robbie, <coughs> Robbie Butler, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So a couple of things here. Um, I think there was a commitment by the Minister to give at least, at least two weeks' notice uh, to parents, to, to uh, representative bodies. And as Pat said, there was a, an executive decision last week uh, based on the evidence that was there. I think the thing that concerns me possibly that what has happened this week is that it is that uncertainty that is, is created. Um, but... What has happened perhaps over this last year is that lack of engagement and consultation. So that would worry me at the moment in terms of what consultation goes on for any changes that might be effective. And secondly, and I think this is most important for me, I know Justin will speak on this uh, at, at length and Justin has uh, at times, um, it's not just about getting our kids back for the sake of the curriculum. Our, our young people need to go back in, as I've said repeatedly, into a space that is safe and conducive to find out where they are, not just with their, their academic lost learning, but also uh, with their mental, mental and well-being state. And then those individualised plans used to plot their way forward. So, I mean, I would just urge caution on anybody in terms of the language that's used. There isn't a person here that doesn't want to see our kids back, but they need to go back into the safest uh, and... and uh, most therapeutic environment that can be given and that isn't available at the moment because we still are in the midst of a pandemic we are not out of this and as the health minister said yesterday we want to avoid a repeat of what we've done in the past we don't want any further lockdowns and we need to take every step possible to ensure that doesn't happen because if we had another lockdown and we had to take our children back out for the same reason again i think that would be unforgivable thanks robbie anyone else want to come in no okay we so as I said, I, I had asked um, that a, a, an oral statement be given. Hopefully that might be the case in, in due course. Um, I also recall that we have invited the Education Minister to attend the Education Committee on the 10th of March, Clark. Isn't that right? Yeah. Um, so um, hopefully that will be possible. Um, there are key decisions being made there, and at the very least they ought to be in consultation with the relevant people and bodies and they ought to be open and transparent and coherent and as i said not not communicated or, or debated um via media absolutely communicated once they've been taken but i think as members have said unhelpful uh, that the decision making process uh, appears to be questioned or drawn out in that context Okay, members, um, we'll move on. Agenda item 2.5. Um, just want to draw members' attention to the Public Accounts Committee report on their uh, review of special educational needs. It's launching tomorrow. Um, Clark, do you want to outline the, the PAC process, um, the Department of Education response, and at what stage we might want to um, reconnect with that issue? Yes, the PAC report is embargoed until midnight tonight um, and then the department will have uh, two months in which to reply to the, I think there are about 10 recommendations um, made by the committee. Um, so a memorandum of response is prepared by the department to each recommendation and that's the end of the PAC process. So after that, if the statutory committee uh, is interested in going back in and exploring um, the matters covered by the report, that's a really good time to do. So, so two months hence, essentially. Okay, and at that stage, we could ask the Department of Education to come and brief the Education Committee on its response to the recommendations, perhaps? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Members content with that approach? Content, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I suspect the report will find uh, the extent of the difficulties that we have encountered as a committee in relation to special educational needs and, and we've also invited the Education Authority to return to the committee in coming weeks as well to make sure progress and rapid progress is being made on those improvements that are desperately needed for children and young people with special educational needs. We'll, we'll continue to make that a priority of this committee. Okay, members, finally, can I uh, thank uh, committee uh, staff member Paula Best 
um, who has worked for the committee for many years and who is moving to a new role in the Assembly Bills Office. I I'm sure you'll all agree that Paula has been uh, an invaluable asset to the committee team uh, for a number of years, and her experience and knowledge of education will stand her in, in great stead in her ongoing Assembly career. Um, we'll miss your cheerful way, Paula. Uh, we look forward to working with you again in our, our other capacities. And we, we wish you all the very best in that new role. And, and thank you for your, your service that you've given to education and, and the Education Committee. Um, Craig Mealy, who some of you will know from the Executive Office and Health Committees, uh, will join us uh, in the coming weeks and will be very welcome to the team. Um, members content that we, we write to Paula to uh, thank her for her service and wish her well in, in her new role. Absolutely, Chair, and uh, just on a, on a personal note, I, I think that her contribution has been excellent, certainly my short time on the Education Committee and very, very grateful for the help that she's been to me and the rest of the committee. Okay, members, thanks for that. Okay then, members, draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 17th of February 2021 at page 6 of your meeting packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Great. That's great. Thank you. Okay, members, I have no matters arising. No. Okay, then we'll move uh, for a short period of time into our closed session uh, with Assembly Research before returning for the uh, rest of our important committee session today with parent action and the Department of Education on the issue to the sitting of the Education Committee. Agenda item six then is our briefing uh, on restrictions, uh, seclusion and restraint. Uh, from parent action. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Clark, we, we have witnesses with us, okay? Yeah, timings are okay. The witnesses are just moving into the spotlight now. Okay, that's great. Well, in the meantime, can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 63? A note of yesterday's informal meeting with parent action at the bottom of table facts. Briefing papers from parent action at pages 66 to 135 and items 1.1 to 1.3 of tabled papers. Can I give a very, very warm welcome uh, to our witnesses today? Uh, Orla, uh, Orla, I, Orla, it's Orla, your surname's Orla Watt, isn't it? Yes, yes sorry, Orla, I have, I have a, a, a note here to the contrary, apologies, but very warm welcome to Orla Watt, Director and Nurse Consultant, uh, Parent Carer uh, Advocate with Parent Action, and uh, Deidre Shakespeare, uh, Parent Advocate, who's with us as well, and a parent with lived experience of, of this issue. Um, who it's a pleasure for me to have met on a, a number of occasions. You're, you're really welcome here this morning, Deidre. Uh, can I also give a really warm welcome to Beth Morrison, uh, founder and CEO of Positive and Active Behavioural Support Scotland. Warm welcome to you as well, Beth. Um, thanks so much uh, to all three of you for being with us this morning. Um, the, the issue of restraint and seclusion is a priority issue uh, for the Education Committee. Um, I uh, had the privilege of, of working with a number of you to draft an, a, an assembly motion in relation to uh, restraint and seclusion, and that has been tabled since July 2020, and it, it does now have all party support, and we hope that that will be debated uh, in the assembly in, in due course. But it, at its heart, it, it, it acknowledges the, the real concern in relation to inappropriate use of restraint and seclusion and makes a very call, clear call on the Education Minister to bring forward um, funded mandatory training on positive therapeutic behaviour strategies and, and statutory mandatory recording and reporting in, in, in relation to restraint and seclusion. We've also taken a, a briefing today from uh, Assembly Research that will inform uh, the work that we will do to ensure that the changes that need to be made are, are brought forward. But, Vital to that work is hearing direct from 
uh, from yourselves on this really important issue. Um, so I think we're going to have uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, to hear from um, all of you. Um, I think uh, we'll hear from Orla to start with and then Deidre and, and Beth before we have time for questions uh, from members. So um, we, we really look forward to hearing from you today and I think we'll start with Orla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, members, for the invitation to come and, and talk with you today. Um, I'd just like to give a brief introduction to Parent Action, and then I'm going to hand over to Deirdre and Beth. So Parent Action is a human rights based organisation which enables and empowers parent carers of children, young people and adults with disabilities and lifelong health conditions to advocate for their child's rights in vital public services. We've created a peer advocacy service to help parent carers express their views on behalf of their child who often has difficulty communicating because of his or her additional needs. These views reflect the lived experience of parent carers and give voice to children, young people and adults with additional needs who are at significant risk of being ignored. So with regards to restraint and seclusion, the very vital issue that we're talking about today, um, parent action advocates have been in discussion with parent carers whose children have experienced, suffered restraint and seclusion in both their mainstream and special schools in Northern Ireland in recent years. Parent carers in our discussions have come up with a number of priorities which Deirdre will expand upon um, and give you more detail on. Um, but I just wanted to summarise what those are um, as a result of our discussions when we were coming together on restraint and seclusion. So first of all, parents want to talk and be involved in the reform and creation of legislation to protect and safeguard children and young people with special educational needs in whatever setting from the practice of restraint and seclusion in Northern Ireland schools in an effective partnership with the parent carers whose children have suffered this practice in their child's school. Um, secondly, the co-design with parent carers of safeguarding policy, procedure, training and support, not just for educational staff in schools, um, but also specifically for boards of governors and at all levels of the education authority, uh, including transport staff and anyone who has likely had to come into contact with children with special educational needs in the education system. Parent carers also are wanting effective and sustainable engagement of parent carers in the crucial work currently being carried out by the Department of Education, um, the Children's Commissioner's Office and the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman around restraint and seclusion. We feel very strongly that a parent carer's voice is crucial to understanding what this is and what the solutions to preventing it ever happening again could currently be. And we also, um, as parent carers, would like to suggest possible solutions to the absence of mental health support for parent carers and children and young people with special educational needs generally, but particularly for those who have suffered restraint and seclusion in, in their school. And this would include the Department of Education and Department of Health recognising together and working together that children with special needs face additional barriers to accessing any mental health services because of their communication difficulties. And this has been outlined in the Children's Commissioner's still waiting review of mental health services in 2018. So we need to develop specific mental health service model for both children and young people and adults with communication difficulties, particularly in the new mental health strategy. And any training that comes out of the work of the Department of Education on Restraint and Seclusion should probably have an underlying ethos of early intervention and prevention of mental health issues in children and young people with special needs particularly. So we want just to include parent carers views on safeguarding policy and procedure review, specifically for children with special needs. We'd also like to request the appointment of a parent carer champion, similar to a mental health champion, um, needed to support parent care advocates through the maze of public service systems that they currently have to engage with in Northern Ireland, trying to get appropriate and timely help for their child with special needs. And finally, we, need, we would like to request the Department of Education align this work with the current work already being done in the Department of Health around implementing the recommendations of the inquiry into hyponatremia related deaths, particularly around the respect for parental involvement recommendations and duty of candour and raising public interest concerns recommendations in public services. Um, thanks very much. I'd like to hand over now to Deirdre and Beth for more detail on that. Thanks. Thanks, Orla. Thanks, Deirdre. Deirdre, are you on mute? Just to check. <laughs> I can't hear you at the moment. Um, Deirdre, in your 
settings, you've got more, a button called more and then AV settings and a microphone array. You can use the slider to increase That's the volume. Okay. Is that you? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dorna, for that introduction. Sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deidre Shakespeare and I am Mom to Harry, a campaign on the misuse of restrictive practices within children's education as co-founder of ICARS, the International Coalition Against Restraint and Seclusion, alongside my colleagues Beth Morrison and Zoe Reid. Our team consists of advocates working internationally, campaigning to eliminate the use of restrictive and aversive practices in school. And I'm also a member of the Risk Group, which aims to reduce restrictive interventions and improve safeguarding for children. I want to thank the Education Committee this morning for giving me this opportunity to share our son Harry's experience about the use of unregulated restrictive practices within his education. Committee members may recall our lobby which you received last year and this has led us to campaign for Harry's Law to ensure good practice across all schools. But in order to achieve this, the first step is ensuring mandatory recording and documenting any incidents of physical or mechanical restraint or the use of seclusion on a child under the care of the education authority in their school. Our son, Harry, has a diagnosis of a learning disability and has communication difficulties. Despite being non-speaking, Harry shows his clear direction by communicating his wishes in other ways. Harry has no physical disabilities or mobility needs, and he is a happy, placid little boy who has tragically experienced excessive, excessive and harmful use of restrictive practices in his education. We have raised particular areas of policy and practice guidance with the need for legislation to protect vulnerable children like Harry and to address gaps in safeguarding actions when children experience harm due to the use of these practices. Sorry, excuse me. At just five years old, we noticed a notable change in Harry's well-being at home and he became very detached, anxious, and he was gripped with fear of everything that was once a comfort to him. I want to give you a little insight into the mental, emotional and physical impact that restraining, secluding and isolating Harry had on our little boy whom we entrusted into the care of his teachers unbeknown to us at that time. Harry began to experience night terrors and he became so distressed and insecure whilst he was awake. He became distant and detached and only allowed us to hold him as he would fall asleep. And this is so different from the little boy that we knew. Harry would wake up crying and we had to catch him as he would try to jump and fear off the bed. He started to suffer panic attacks and it was painful watching our son become so fearful of his life around him. And on occasions, Harry would silently cry. Tears would trickle down his face and we struggled seeing so much sadness. It was really difficult watching our son breaking down and not really understanding the reasons why. Harry would defecate in fear when we left our home even on a simple car journey, he presented fearful and anxious to the extent that it became almost impossible to leave our home. And I shamefully felt imprisoned alongside, alongside Harry and his anxiety and, and his fear. Disturbingly, Harry started to rock back and forth and he would bang his head on the sofa where he would pace back and forth when he became fearful of moving around our home. And he didn't like his touching him and his eyes looked haunted. He would cower in fear whenever he was approached. In time, I suspected everything was not okay at school. Harry became fearful of any movement or touch around his feet. And it was devastating to find out later that the school had tied his feet to a chair. And the course of restraining him. I received playbooks at the end of the school term where part of the jigsaw fell into place as we started to piece together why Harry's emotional and mental well-being had declined. Page after page, there were pictures of Harry restrained in a chair, and you need to remember that this is a child with no mobility issues. He had been photographed strapped to a chair for play with water, messy play, schoolwork, and for feeding, and this was clearly an everyday practice. Whilst there was occasions that I had seen Harry in the chair in the past, he hadn't been the only child on that occasion, and like many other parents, we trusted the professionals used the chair only for particular tasks. It wasn't until his social worker alerted me to the evident misuse of the chair that we realised that Harry was routinely mechanically restrained. In other photos, Harry was held in reins, another form of mechanical restraint, as other children played freely in the playground. He was segregated from his peers, humiliated, made indifferent. 
Other photos showed Harry suspended in a chair in midair in the classroom, where he towered above his peers. And on other occasions, he was forced to touch objects by staff forcing his arm, in spite of photos evidencing that he displayed fear, anxiety, and discomfort. Among the us, he was routinely wheeled around for convenience, as it was later reported by staff that Harry had dropped to the ground during transitioning from rooms. He was photographed strapped to a chair by his waist, and his feet were tied to that chair, and there was a table on there. And the look, was, the look and fear on his face it's really haunted me. He was punished as scenes to meet the needs of the school, who discriminated against him due to his disability. As a family, we had to work hard to help Harry build his trust in us again, because we failed him too. We sent him to school daily, and I really dread to think what he suffered. Yet Harry's story is just one of many children in Northern Ireland who have experienced physical and mechanical restraint in the course of their education. There is currently no legal obligation to record and report whenever any restraint or seclusion is used, yet the Department of Education of the schools that is should with their own guidance. Families report restraint is used as a first response to situations that may arise when a child or young person with a disability is trying to communicate an unmet need. Any intervention used with children who have additional needs should be therapeutic, and that means that it should be soothing, de-escalating a crisis, and beneficial to the child's well-being and ongoing development and learning. In our UK-wide campaign, families report that restraining or seclusion of children has been described as therapeutic when parents raise concerns about the treatment of their children. The term therapeutic has been misused in this context to justify incidents of restraint and seclusion in schools, and this does not reflect the physical, emotional, and mental impact on a distressed child and the trauma that continues afterward where restraint and seclusion has taken place. On today, today, on behalf of Harry, I appeal to you, without recognition of this harm, there is no healing. And in your capacity of legislators, we urge you to take action and support us in our call for mandatory requirements for all schools to record any use of restrictive interventions, whether they are physical, mechanical, use of seclusion, medication, or blanket restrictions. Mandatory reporting to parents, guardians, and the education authority to be jointly signed by parents and schools. Mandatory training for all teachers who use restrictive interventions with external scrutiny, including a definition of what a last resort and the regulation to its use. Mandatory inclusion of positive behaviour support strategies and any training for teachers working with children with disabilities and additional needs. Positive behaviour support to be understood as not simply therapeutic intervention, but a framework designed to help school leaders use a multi-tiered approach to social, emotional and behaviour support within any learning environment. Statutory requirement for the Department of Education and the Education Authority to implement the Children's Northern Ireland 1995 Order and its core principles into all schools. Statutory duty for social workers to investigate any parental concerns in schools in relation to the use of restraint and seclusion as per their duty of care and to work in partnership with the education welfare officers. Legislate for duty of candour to improve standards into all public sectors. Standardise and regulated policies and practice guidance for all schools which are openly shared with parents, guardians and carers. Greater accountability when children are deemed to be harmed by staff in schools including the Board of Governors to be held accountable when they neglect their duty of care and responsibility to safeguard children. I have shared an overview with the committee today of my child's experience, but unfortunately, we know Harry is not alone. There are lobbies across the UK, Ireland and internationally with families calling for support to change practice and prevent the harm imposed on vulnerable children and young people. As families living the trauma, having our children restrained at school, we cannot stress enough the pain that we have suffered and the fear that other children are still at risk. Please listen to our stories and embrace the policy and legislative changes presented to you today. And that concludes my opening remarks. And I'm going to hand you over to um, my colleague, Beth Morrison, CEO of PADS. Beth, just, just to pause for a second, Beth, before I bring you in, um, Katie, can I just say thank you? Thank you. Thank you for your your evidence and your advocacy today. Um, Thank you. You, you, you. You've never, ever failed, Harry, ever. Your your advocacy on his behalf has has been exceptional. Um, Harry should never have had that experience, um, and no other child should either. 
um, and the work the work that you have done and are doing is is moving us closer to achieving that aim and and this committee will do everything that we can to make sure we support that work um, but I just wanted to say thank you um, and, and I'll bring and we will have opportunity to speak to you more in, in more detail about those issues that that you you so capably raised thank you I'll bring bring Beth in thank you Beth Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's um, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Beth Morrison and I'm Callum's mummy. Uh, I am also the CEO of uh, PABS and I uh, also am co-founder of iCars alongside my good friend and colleague Deirdre Shakespeare and Zoe Reid. And, um, I'm also an external expert advisor for the UK Restraint Reduction Network and a founding member of the Scottish Restraint Reduction Network. I'm on the board of Enable Scotland, which is the largest Scottish charity for people with learning disabilities. And I currently sit on the Scottish Government Short Life Working Group developing national guidance around the use of restraint and seclusion in schools. And like Deirdre, I'm here today to ask for your help. Um, a bit of background about why and how I got here. Um, my wonderful son Callum has epilepsy, cerebral palsy, autism and learning disabilities. He is a young adult now, but when he was just 11 years old, he was restrained by four adults in his special school. They did this to Callum because he didn't want to come off a bike that he was riding in the school gym hall. And these people held my small disabled son face down on the floor in a deadly prone position and with so much force that he couldn't breathe. Medical evidence suggests he lost consciousness and he urinated. Only then did the staff pick Callum up off the floor, but they then strapped him down in a chair and stood over him with an egg timer to indicate he was being punished. And that was 10 years ago. To this day, despite expert witness reports saying the injuries Callum had as a result of the restraint were usually only seen post-mortem, no one was ever held accountable for the way he was treated. My husband and I became really vocal. We were utterly devastated. We had no idea that schools could do these things to children. And I became very vocal and began to hear from other parents whose children had been treated in a similar way. First of all, it was local parents and then it was much more widely. I then discovered that there was no national guidance on the use of restraint and seclusion at any schools for any of the countries in the UK. So I decided to do something about it. And I've been campaigning, first of all, in Scotland but now I have around 1,200 family cases from all over the UK and Northern Ireland and I campaign worldwide now. In 2014-15, I submitted a Scottish parliamentary petition calling on the Scottish Government to introduce national guidance for children in schools. In 2017, the Scottish Government published Included, Engaged and Involved Part 2 but this was inadequate and it wasn't rights-based. After the Scottish Children's Commissioner, Bruce Adamson, got involved, No Safe Place was published in December 2018, and in the autumn of 2019, Bruce Adamson used his legal powers for the first time ever. Working with the EHRC, they raised a judicial review in the Scottish courts. Following this intervention, the Scottish Government agreed to produce human rights-based guidance to protect children and young people. We're working on this with the Scottish Government currently and the guidance is expected to be published in the spring of this year. Now I met Deirdre almost four years ago when she contacted me about Harry's experience. I knew of similar cases in Northern Ireland and I think I've sent you some data on the cases that we had over a two year period and they were included as part of the risk report which you've also seen. Uh, Deirdre and I went to the House of Lords last year as part of the risk group 
to launch the report and we believe it's the largest data set of its kind in the world. So I'm really here today, first of all, to support Deirdre uh, and to ask the Northern Ireland Assembly to produce rights-based mandated guidance for reporting, training as per the 10 points that Deirdre has already submitted and I absolutely support Harry's Law and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Beth, thank you so much as well for the advocacy, uh, the effective advocacy that, that you've taken forward on behalf of, of your son uh, and behalf of so many other children and young people as well. Um, you've made real progress in Scotland and I know that that work is ongoing, but it's, it's I, I'm sure um, Deidre and other uh, parents and families in Northern Ireland are extremely grateful for the support that, that you've been able to, to provide here. Um, and we as a committee will be extremely grateful for the, um, the, the practice that we can uh, look to in Scotland um, in order to make sure that we um, rapidly put the framework that, that uh, Orla, Deidre and yourself uh, have all spoken to so capably this morning that needs to be put into place. So thank, thank you so much. I, I'm going to go straight to uh, members this morning um, and I'll bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA. Thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thanks to Deirdre, Beth and, uh, and Orla. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure everyone will agree that uh, some of your evidence here today has been extremely harrowing uh, and no doubt uh, you've had horrendous experiences uh, of, of what has been taking place. Uh, I'm just relatively new on to the health committee within the past few weeks, but I have uh, experience of, of, of something similar uh, in the scandal that took place in Muckamore Abbey Hospital with uh, learning disability patients uh, and that's subject of a public inquiry now uh, and, and criminal proceedings as well. Uh, so I don't want to say too much about that due to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, it's still under investigation. Uh, except to say that some of the uh, activity that took place was in the context of the use of restraint, uh, physical restraint, and the use of seclusion. Uh, and, you know, it's it's actually the use of seclusion in particular was being recorded and documented. So there, there, there was evidence there about how often it was being used. Uh, and in some cases, patients were being placed in a seclusion room uh, up to 70 and 80 times a month for sometimes two to three hours at a time, you know, so rather than it being used as a last resort and there were guidelines from the Belfast Trust uh, as to the, 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 the when and how seclusion in particular should be used, it was clear that it wasn't being used uh, according to the guidelines. So guidelines on their own only have a certain amount of value. Uh, and, and what's important in my view in all of this is oversight and accountability. Uh, if, there's, if there's no oversight and if there's no accountability, because you see, as a, as, a, as a committee and as public representatives, we have responsibilities. And, and, and one of the responsibilities is to ensure that people like yourselves who come to us uh, are properly represented and whatever grievances that you have are dealt with. Uh, but we also have a responsibility to future generations to try and ensure whatever has happened to your children doesn't happen again. And that's, that's why we have to put in place a framework that en ensures that that doesn't happen. There, there will always be abuses, you know, of some sort or other. We can't legislate for everything. 
But the key in, in all of this, in my view, is a, a accountability. Uh, and I mean, I have no doubt that where abuse has taken place, uh, those against whom there is evidence will be held to account. But where where are senior management going to be held to account? Where are those who should have been providing oversight? Uh, when are they going to be held to account? And the answer is probably never. Uh, so so that's important to, to build that into whatever framework we want to talk about. But I'm sorry for uh, the long-winded approach there. I, I wanted to ask you, have you had any engagement with the education department here and have they shown any desire or commitment to bring forward the necessary changes? Thanks. And whoever wants to take that can go ahead. Um, I have had engagements with the Education Authority, um, but they signposted me back to the Board of Governors when I had approached them. And the Board of Governors made me um, attend a meeting with them. Um, my husband and I attended, and they failed to acknowledge the harm that they had done. And they asked us for another meeting because we did not accept what they had said. Um, produced to us um, as a response to our concerns and um, then we were I went back to the education authority again and they suggest that we go to NEPSO so we went to NEPSO but, but at that stage um, there was a police investigation and because um, NEPSO had said that it would overlap with the police investigation so that they couldn't take it forward and um, the police investigation just was just horribly wrong in every sense. Um, I don't feel like they supported my son in any way or supported us in any way. Um, and I feel that like Harry was treated very poorly and he was the victim here. Yeah. Okay. Orla, or, uh, any uh, that asked key, key question there was. Uh, engagement from the Department of Education with any parents in terms of the work that needs to be done? Well, I mean, our role in Parent Action really is to support Deirdre um, in her valiant efforts to try and engage with the education authorities who should, like you say, Pat, have been providing oversight to the people who subjected her children to this um, in an earlier, you know, much earlier, so it, it, it's it's um, I think Deirdre is probably best to speak on that on her experiences of trying just to simply get her voice heard, Pat, um, to try and stop this behavior from adults around her child in school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, there, there was there was no real engagement to be to be honest. Um, we were just signing posted to NAPSO to to further our complaint that in that in that regard. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let me bring Pat back in there, Pat. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for that. And uh, one, of, one of our roles as elected representatives and as an education committee is that we can help you get over all the obstacles and the bureaucracy that's put in your place uh, to, to get to the bottom of all these issues and to bring about change. Uh, but and, and I said this yesterday, Orla, um, you'll recall, uh, in, in all of these cases where there are grievances and injustices, it's actually the families and the advocates who drive change. Uh, uh, all, all we can do as politicians is help you do that. And, I mean, there, you'll find you're pushing an open door with this committee that we are committed to helping uh, bring about change. I mean, I think in 2021... Uh, it's uh, it's disgraceful that there is no clear guidance uh, and guidance that should have, in my view, statutory underpinning uh, to ensure that this type of, of behaviour isn't taking place in our schools. Uh, and, you know, uh, we know that this type of restraint is often described in some way as being therapeutic uh, and I think, you know, we're not in the dark ages anymore. Uh, we know that restraint, and, and many psychiatrists will agree with us, that uh, restraint, physical restraint and seclusion does not have any therapeutic value whatsoever. 
Now, I couldn't couldn't sit here and say that there can never be a case for physically restraining someone. I, I can't say that. But certainly only as a very last resort. And we know, and I know from my experience dealing with the Muckamore families, that sometimes the agitated behaviour of patients was caused, for example, because they were in pain. There, there, was, there was one patient who hadn't seen a dentist in 10 years and had severe, severe uh, uh, toothache. Which, which, and, and because they were non-verbal, they weren't able to express what the problems were. So there needs to be training, uh, absolutely uh, vital. There needs to be reporting uh, and there needs to be accountability and oversight. And you won't find okay. any disagreement here. Thanks, thanks for that, Pat. and And thanks to the three of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Beth, uh, Orla, and Deirdre. I, I know Deirdre personally. We've had many conversations, and we've met about this on a number of occasions, and I know how strongly she feels about this issue uh, and how strongly she has been uh, a voice for so many families and children uh, out there, particularly given the experiences of experiences of her and her uh, young son Harry, uh, I welcome the presentations today and for uh, the courage of speaking up and speaking out because it's not an easy thing to do, uh, and uh, it's certainly not uh, 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 something a topic that's easy to talk about. But I, I just want to put firmly on record: you have my full support. And I have just two questions for you, uh, uh, and I, any of you can take them. Uh, I'm interested in the comment that was made in relation to the appointment of a parent care champion uh, to the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, and I note that it, it's been said that it would be helpful. What role do you see this champion playing uh, and what power should the champion have? Thanks, Daniel. Orla? Yes, I'm, I'm happy enough to answer that. Thanks for the question, Daniel. So um, it really is is something in, with regards to our many discussions, not just about restraint and seclusion, um, which we as parent carers definitely see as a safeguarding issue and a safeguarding issue that currently isn't included in, in policy. Um, it's, in, it's around what Pat was saying there really about accountability. And currently, parent carers experience of everything, all public services, health and education particularly, but others as well, is um, a maze, an un, un, indescribable maze of services, as Deirdre very eloquently put it there, about the amount of times that she had to try and speak to people and she was put off and put back and forward and round in circles and the stress that added to the fact that her child had been harmed by the adult supposed to be caring for him. Um, and yesterday, the other parent care was able to share that she had contacted 52 organisations, Daniel, and not one of them was actually able at that time, two and a half years ago, to do anything to stop the restraint seclusion that her child was suffering in his school. So the idea of a parent care champion is similar to um, the advocacy role that Deirdre's talking about here, that Beth is talking about here, what the parent carers are, are advocates for our children. We are, we just are, all parents are. But children with, um, who uh, have special needs require their parents to speak for them on more occasions than children who don't have special needs, as you guys are very well aware of. Um, so what's required is really, as Pat was saying there, um, families are the ones, we know that, are the ones who have to fight this fight and to succeed for our children. We can't switch it off. We can't switch off the parenting thing. Um, and we are the only voice for our children. So what we're asking for in the parent care champion role is to support us just to do that, to be the parents we want to be. Yeah. Um, so that would be in our vision co-designed with parent carers, not just parent carers who have um, whose child has suffered restraint seclusion, but all the other barriers that your committee and you members have been hearing from parent carers, especially over the last year, because they've become so much more visible with the global pandemic. So it's taking all those views, finding the similarities and devising a role for this person. The idea of this person being based in the Northern Ireland Executive is, is in response to the Children's Cooperation Bill of 2015, where there is now a legal obligation on departments to work together to pool resources. And I know you guys have been talking about this as well to other um, contributors to the committee over time. So it's, it's just really um, similar to how the Mental Health Champion now currently is placed to 
cover mental health as an underpinning to all of these things. The parent care champion, parents have to engage with all these departments when your child has special needs. We have no choice. We need support of government to raise our children to be the parents we want to be and for them to reach their potential. We need a okay. champion to help us to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Those are very key points. I speak as an uncle of a, of a five-year-old child that is severely autistic, and I can see, particularly during the pandemic, the huge strain that is on my sister as Ashton's mum. And I understand as well, every single day she worries about his development and worries about the lack of support services that are there and, and, and how they have been impacted during the pandemic. And parents are genuinely uh, struggling uh, at the present time and there is a desperate need for a voice, uh, someone central to stand up for, the, for, for those families out there uh, that find themselves in these difficult circumstances with these children with complex need uh, 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 at this time. So thank you for that. Uh, another another question, Chair, if you indulge me briefly. One of your recommendations is invest in early intervention, prevention and training in order to support both families and staff to use evidence-based approaches to address challenging behaviour. Uh, I would be particularly interested to hear how you think provision could be made better for children during the time immediately before they commence their education and how could that transition period be better managed from both the perspective a perspective of the parent and the school. And I've raised this point a number of times. I think this is an important one. Would you like to go with that one, Beth, Deirdre? Yeah? Yes, uh -huh, absolutely. Um, we, uh, as the founder and CEO of PABS, uh, behaviour is what we do. Um, we advocate understanding that all behaviour is a form of communication. And bearing in mind that the, the huge majority of the children affected by this in school are small children. 26% of the children in our family case studies are six years old. We're having children as young as two, three and four being subjected to restrictive practices preschool. So we absolutely have to work um, in an early intervention capacity. We work tirelessly with parents trying to um, you know train them we do free training or very very low cost training to parents and uh, in Scotland I'm working towards hopefully working with the government to try and make sure that what we're doing training parents is the same training that we would roll out via the Scottish government for staff so that everyone's singing from the, hem the same hymn sheet. We must understand that children who have conditions like autism uh, or severe learning disabilities that can't speak or have very serious communication difficulties, they use behaviour to communicate distress because it's all they have. And we must give that the skills and the expertise to the families from a very early age and we're not doing that at the moment and I think that's really you know it's very very important and it, I think it should come from the government there's a lot of training organizations out there that focus on restrictive practices as a way of managing challenging behavior I think we need to change the language around challenging behavior it's not challenging behavior it's distressed behavior and we've got to give parents carers and staff the right skills to be able to support these children and respond to their distress. Yeah, I, th I think Beth, the, 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 those are very important points. And, and like uh, I said to my sister last week, because it seemed she was exhausted, I would watch uh, Ashton for, for a period of time. And I, I can tell you, after 20 minutes in, I was absolutely exhausted. I just couldn't believe uh, uh, how challenging his behaviour is and how it has affected her and how much support uh, this the child needed. And there's many, many examples across Northern Ireland where families are in those uh, circumstances. I actually went to her and I said, I do not understand how you're coping uh, because it, 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 it's full on. So I, I, I can see for from my own family uh, how, how difficult it is for people and how important it is that the support is there for, for families firstly and absolutely for the staff within the environments uh, that are there to support uh, these children uh, so you have my full support everything you've said today i've taken on board strongly as i said deirdre has a direct line to me anything that uh, it needs to be said she, she knows to contact myself or david and, and uh, 
I, I understand completely. So anything we can do, uh, we're here to support you. And it's important that we get the, the support for these families, particularly at this time. Thanks, Daniel. Daniel, can I just say that, uh, you know, please pass your sister on to me. I'd be more than happy to give some advice and help there. Not a okay. problem. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring Robbie Butler, MLA in, please? Thank you. Sure, thanks uh, for just putting your, your, your chair hand on me earlier on because I, I was getting, uh, as I read our report, you guys went on the, the, the briefing we had before and it was, uh, the report was excellent. You'll get a chance to look at it, but I was fit to be tied, genuinely fit to be tied. Um, two of you are already friends of mine, dear Dianora, and a pleasure to meet you, uh, Beth. And I've said this a number of times that uh, specifically when we're talking about mental health, the transformation of mental health, sometimes you can be the right person in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm going to address uh, something that probably all of you feel as mums, and particularly something that Deirdre shared there. And, it was, and I've picked up on this, and Pat, uh, Deirdre, and I think I've said this to you before, you're not in any shape or form of failure because this is the reality of when you get something sorted out for your own child, and I shared this with another mum this week, the easy thing to do perhaps is that you're sorted and then you move on and you've got another life and you've got your other family to look after, but you're not giving up and you're determined to see change. And I do believe that you guys will uh, bring and, and drive the change here. And, and as, as Pat and Daniel have already said, as a, as a committee, we're, we're absolutely wedded to this, guys. Thank you for all of the hard work that you guys have done and the, the reach across the pond. Beth is, is really, really valuable, valuable to us. I'm on, just on two issues, guys. I'm not going to uh, stretch this out too far because um, there's a lot has already been said and you've already given us through the example of Harry's Law what needs to be done. So I'm not going to unpick that at all, guys, okay? What I'm going to say is I did raise um, the issue of, of, of maybe a champion that was in uh, was in and around special uh, needs schools. Now, what happened after that was there's some um, very uh, motivated people on Twitter got on to me and says, this is what it's need for. And I just want to, to say that when I introduced that in the assembly as an idea, it was to address this as well. Uh, we, you know that there are a number of studies out there on special education uh, needs at the moment. There's a lot of work to be done, and I do think there is room possibly for possibly a time-bound champion to deliver all of this and be the voice for those children. So uh, we did certainly endorse that and support that, guys. Then just one question. Beth, you had said you had a data set that was the biggest, largest in the world. Is that correct? And if that is the case, could you maybe take a minute or so to tell us a little bit more about that? I thought that was quite a, a remarkable statement and might be very useful. Yes, certainly. Um, well, as I said in my opening remarks that uh, I was very vocal and I was contacted by so many families all over the world. And um, I started to collect very specific information from the families through a, a completely anonymous questionnaire and the it allowed families a voice it allowed families to say this is what happened to my child so i asked very specific questions um like for example was there a diagnosis what age was the child? Why were the restraints happening? Um, what was the result of you know the restraint if the parent had complained? What was the results of their complaint? And quite importantly for me, what the injuries were and who was the training provider? And uh, over a period of time from June 2017 till September 2019, I collected 720 cases. That's, you know, on average, one a day. I spoke to every single one of these families. I supported them and, uh, you know, gave them a lot of advice and a lot of advice about behaviour as well. And uh, that then formed the basis of the risk report, which I've sent to you. And uh, it was, the data was um, analysed by Professor Richard Hastings' team at Warwick University. And Deirdre and I presented that alongside members of the risk group, uh, including the Challenging Behaviour Foundation in the House of Lords last year. Um, now, I think considering we had no money, we had no funding to do that, I think we did really well. Um, and since then, however, since September 2019, uh, I've gone from 720 families up to just about, I think it's 1,158 today. 
So there's a lot of children that this is affecting and it's affecting not just the children, but the families as well. The trauma is unbelievable. Um, so yes, it's the biggest uh, data set in the world. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. And I think um, just picking up on Daniel's point about the preschool piece is really important because um, uh, Pat had talked about um, Muckamore and, and and really if we, we've got to value all, everyone uh, and, and make sure that the journey from from birth right through to um, whenever we, we die is we're doing the very best and we have absolutely failed in many in many ways uh, whether it's been children or adults and we we need to refocus guys so um, thank you so much for your presentations today powerful powerful presentations um, Deirdre again you, you helped me sort of calm down a wee bit to where my anger was it's a good anger by the way but you, you've helped me sort of channel that as did the chair so I uh, appreciate that guys and just hope we can really do something uh, very very soon in regard to bringing this forward thank you thank you thank you Robbie thanks Robbie and obviously we'll have the Department of Education in our, our next session this morning to, to start our our work in, in getting a, an update uh, on the, the action uh, that needs to be taken forward. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please? Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to Orla, Deidre and Beth for um, coming here today. Um, it's my first time meeting Deidre and Beth. Um, but thank you for bringing your stories. I know that can't be easy to recount that, uh, but we really appreciate it. And I think it's so important for everyone to hear it in open session to know exactly what um, has happened and what like ideas and solutions you're bringing forward to make sure it doesn't stop or it doesn't continue and as other members have said um, because it's a real testament to yourselves that even though you've been through it with your children you haven't just stopped there that you want to bring um, forward legislation to help protect children in the future so thank you for that and well done for that um, Deidre, one of the points you made in your, uh, like in the priorities you want us to take forward was about mandatory um, incident recording and reporting to parents. To be honest, I can't believe that it's not mandatory um, for any kind of service, any public service. I can't believe that it's not mandatory to report incidents like that there. Um, I come from a background of, in like a medical background of um, in a dental practice. And even then, because your patients are in your care, anything that happens, it must be recorded and shared. So I, I'm, I'm just so surprised that it isn't um, within the educational um, setting, you know. Um, and I find it really concerning that there seems to be no data in the North for um, restraint, restraint and seclusion incidents. So really, we've no idea how widespread it is. Um, I find that so... Um, Concerning, so for that reason alone, I fully um, back Deidre and what um, and those points that you made, and as other members again have said, um, I think you know now you're fully supported by this committee, and I'll give my personal full support too. One um, topic I wanted to ask you about was um, staff training, and how basically how do you see? staff training going forward, what exactly do you think staff um, in these educational settings um, require, including uh, maybe resourcing? Can you kind of shed any light on where you'd like to see that going forward, please? Sorry, was that directed to me? Beth, did you want to take this about training? Whoever would like to, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The training, as we've already said, is absolutely necessary. And I think not just for, for staff, but for parents as well, so that we're all adopting the same approach. Uh, PABS also advocates the use of a bespoke communication passport. And the passport is really, it's, it's really, really valuable because it, it's written in the voice of the child and it talks about how the child wants to live their life. We also um, have a positive behaviour support plan incorporated in the communication passport and that gives everyone uh, the information on what is required to, you know, support the child, respond to the child's distress if it happens, how you can de-escalate that. And if everybody has the passport and everybody's working with the passport, uh, then you know we're, we're all doing the same things to meet the needs of the child and uh, to, to make sure that their well-being is ensured. But the training 
also needs to be um, accredited by someone like the British Institute of Learning Disabilities. That's the gold standard of accreditation. I work very closely with them. They do a PBS coaches programme, which is excellent. It's evidence-based, very, very um, well used within health and social care, but unfortunately it's not in education. And I think the use of positive behaviour strategies in education is what we really need going forward. Being proactive, meeting the needs of the child. And as I say, happy children don't challenge. And that's what we want. We want to ensure the well-being and the happiness of our children going forward. And if everybody can keep our children happy, then we're all safe and we're all happy. Yep, absolutely, Beth. I think Deirdre, it was you that said earlier um, about your son that he was being punished to meet the needs of the school. Um, and that I think, Beth, you just said that we need to be meeting the needs of the child. And that's what is a fundamental issue here, isn't it? Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and again, thanks very much for coming here today with your stories. And we'll do all we can to make sure that changes are made. Thank you. And thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola, for that. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLR? Thanks, Chair. Chair, who's, who's left on committee now? Further, do you mean questions further to yourself? No, who, who's here? Who, who's in the committee? It, uh, myself, uh, Pat, Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, uh, Daniel McCrossan, MLA, Rory Butler, MLA, Nicola Brogan, MLA, and yourself. Okay, um, that's that's worrying for me. There's, is, is this matter not important enough for some members to participate in? To be very very distressed with that and worried about that and angry about that. Very angry about that. Um, Orla, Deirdre, Beth, your presentation this morning has been very, very powerful. It's been disturbing. It's been upsetting. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your bravery. I want to thank you for your courage. I want to thank you for your campaigning. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of the children who are going to be prevented from experiencing what your kids have experienced. I can't begin to empathize what you as parents, the pain you are experienced and have experienced as parents, the anguish, the, the anger, the despair, but you've turned that into something positive. You've turned that into something powerful, and you deserve, you deserve enormous, enormous credit for that. And take take huge pride in what you have done. You're very, you're, you're an unbelievable examples. You're powerful, powerful women, and I take my hat off you. Unbelievable. Well done, ladies. Um, in terms of the carrot and stick approach, that's what it comes down to. It's the carrot and stick. So what to date, what you've you've described is the stick approach has been adopted by schools and places of education, which is shocking. It's draconian. It sounds like something out of medieval times. It just is bewildering to know that that is happening in this day and age. It is absolutely incredible. Tell me more in terms of what you see as the value of the carrot approach. Any volunteers there to take that question? Go on ahead. If you, ladies, if you want to go first. Can I just ask you to repeat your last, like oh, the carrot approach you said? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously we've, we've got a lot of families. Um, I've got a lot of information in my head. And what I see, I read a lot of incident reports, a lot of um, records that, that have been done uh, for children and you know they talk about the child being violent and aggressive and there's no understanding of the child using their behavior to communicate so when you have a child who can't speak uh, or has very little communication uh, verbally they can't say i'm hungry i'm thirsty i'm tired i'm bored the lights are too bright it's too noisy in here for me or i am in pain and the response to that child's distress is punishment what are we saying to those children who are being held forcibly in chairs strapped in chairs dragged along the corridor and put into what we hear are quiet rooms, uh, blue rooms, every colour of the rainbow rooms, but they, I call them cupboards because that's what they are. And it's this overly punitive approach that I'm really, really concerned about. And I think what we have to remember here is that, you know, we're not here to represent 
neurotyp neurotypical children who are behaving willfully. Our children may be five, six, seven years old chronologically, but cognitively, some of them are babies. What on earth are we doing allowing this practice to happen in a place that children should be safe? And I think that, you know, we can't underestimate that, yes, teachers and education staff are under a lot of pressure. Yes, they are stressed. But what we absolutely must do is to make sure that those staff are supported and they have the right skills and the right training. That may mean that we've got to look at the way teachers are trained before they get to the job. But I think we've got to support them. We have to develop um, a child-centred uh, framework for training uh, and understanding behaviour as communication and how staff can respond to that correctly so that we're meeting the needs and the wellbeing of our children. I don't like the carrot and stick approach, as you can probably, as you can hear, but um, that's my views. Can I just jump in there as well? Thanks for that, Beth. Just to add what, to what Beth's saying there, just in, in answer to your question. So the carrot approach, I'm scribbling furiously while listening to Beth, is we need to take it back to children's rights. Children with special needs are children first and always. They're for their parents or parents first as well. Um, every child has the right to be safe. Every child has the right to access the curriculum, no matter if they are dying. And some of the children that we work with in parent action have life limiting, life threatening conditions. They're, they still have the right to go to school. They still have the right to access their education and grow and develop. And that's what that's what we need to bring it back to. When you're talking about the carrot, you need to ask yourself and the people who are looking after our children need to ask themselves, what are my values around the fact that this child is a child first? Their disabilities are irrelevant. If a child who didn't have disabilities experienced this, can you imagine the uproar? Um, and it wouldn't have got to this and it wouldn't have taken three years for some families to get to this point um, of speaking to your good selves. Um, Justin, you weren't, uh, we were talking with another parent carer yesterday around this. And again, it's about the safeguarding duties and her experience would show that there is the fact of discrimination in our minds when we look at children with special needs. Um, the whole society in the UK, as Beth has clearly put across, and, and internationally, that the, the medical model of disability means we focus on what the child's diagnosis is, not the fact that they're a child. And what happens then is uh, there's an awful lot of parent blaming goes on. We were talking a bit about victim blaming yesterday of the child, and the child is definitely a victim. There's a lot of parent blaming for the child's disability that goes on in people's minds. That's the level of discrimination we're talking about here. And that's what we have to change. We have to change people's understanding of their own values and beliefs around children with disability and parents and parents' role in caring for the child with a disability and the fact that they are parents and the fact that their parenting or ability or skills does not impact on the child's disability. Talking okay. to a social worker, a senior one a few weeks ago, and um, asking what support the family had got when a child had a disability and was told they'd been sent to parenting classes. And I had to say to her that no amount of parenting classes are going to remove this child's disability. What else are you offering to support the parents? So that's the sort of thinking that we're coming up across. So CARA is recognising that the parents and only the parents can make decisions about whether restraint and seclusion is used. It's called parental responsibility. There do mention the children's order. It's a legal right. Not even a GP or a teacher can make a decision on an intervention with a child, especially a physical one. So it's recognition of parents, recognition of the children's order and training around that but with the intention of early intervention to prevent not only restraint and seclusion having to be used, but to prevent emotional well-being and mental health issues. Mental health crises is what children who have what are called meltdowns when they have special needs. They're in mental health crisis. And that's Christine Lennon um, in the Department of Health in England has said that in her 2016 report. We need to start recognising them as children and the fact when they are exhibiting this challenging, which is actually, as Beth said, distressed behaviours. These children are communicating distress, fear and anxiety, and to punish them for doing that or for self-regulating, you know, with like stimming or doing whatever it is. My son walks around and talks to himself, that's his stimming. And he's if he was, a, he was never punished for that, but these parents' children have been. So it's recognition that this is the child and this is what the child's behaviour is communicating to you. It's communicating fear and distress. Same as with the Muckamore family's pet. They're communicating fear and distress and what was the intervention? 
create more fear and distress for them, traumatize them. And then the experiences of parents of trying to stop that happening, Justin, is very important. Parents were bullied and uh, as a, um, the, their complaints were ignored. And then with significant pressure, mostly from MLAs, suddenly they, then they were dealt with grossly incompetently. So it's about recognizing that parents are not swinging the lead when they're saying the third of things um, and engaging with proper safeguarding procedures, which are already in place, they're just not being followed. So the carrot is just children's rights, safeguarding duties. You know, going back to that, these people did not abide by their safeguarding duties and their children's right duties to our children. And then the fact that we need to recognize and be vocal about challenging discrimination. When you think you, you're going to act in a particular way to a child with a disability, you need to stop and ask yourself, what is the child communicating to me and why am I behaving like this? So um, it's, it's bringing it back to the fact they're children. I mean, it's not rocket science. They're children. Be respectful and, and the same with parents. Thanks very much. Justin. Well, thank you very much. That was powerful. Powerful to hear your words, Oriel. Thank you. And thank you again to all three of you. Really, really um, powerful women. Thank you very much for your presentation today. And we'll do everything as a committee to try and support you in your endeavours. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Don't think I have any other members indicating uh, questions at, at this stage. Um, Deidre, Orla, Beth, like all of our members have said this morning, thank you. Thank you for your your evidence, your your testimony. Um, we will we will make sure that this committee does not ignore you. And we have our next session with the Department of Education where we will start asking the questions and making the proposals that need to be made. To, to move these matters forward. Um, we, we look forward to remaining in contact with you all. Um, you have lived experience and expertise uh, that is vital to addressing uh, these feelings and to putting the, the right policy and practice in place. Um, and I suspect the Department of Education has not uh, engage that to the extent it should have at this stage and I sincerely hope that the education committee engagement with them will change that rapidly. Um, do you want to make any closing remarks, Orla, Deidre, uh, Beth? Deidre, yeah, go ahead there. I just wanted to, to say um, thank you for the education committee for um, having us on today and listening to um, our children and I really want you to consider the, the 10 points, Chris, as I'm sure that you're very familiar with at this stage. Um, I also want to extend an open invitation for the Education Committee members if you would like to attend um, a meeting that I have organised with parent kind with other families and their children who have experienced um, failures in their education um, and if, if um, Jane from Parentkind and Jerry Cameron from the EA are meeting with these parents. So I would just like to extend that invitation to yourselves. If you would like to attend, you can contact Jane after after the session or myself to organise that. Um, because I think it's very, very important that we do listen to parents and we do listen to children. We do have a, a young lady who will be attending that night um, who experienced occlusion. Um, so she wants to voice her concerns um, how she's treated in her education to ensure that other children aren't going to be treated how she was. So that's that's all I have. Do you do I want to pass you over to Orla? Thank, you. Thanks, Adrian. If you pass those details there, so obviously yeah. we'll, we'll respond to that. Thank, thank you so much. Yep. Just to say thank you, uh, Chair, members. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, Orla. I would just like to finish by saying this is a national human rights scandal. It's not just happening in Northern Ireland, it's happening all over the world. And children with disabilities are supposed to be, um, they have prote protected characteristics under the UNCRC. And we, Scotland is going to be incorporating the UNCRC into Scottish domestic law. And I'm hoping that that's going to be the game changer in Scotland. But, you know, I would just really like to, to call again, um, please help us to uphold children's human rights in Northern Ireland. This is an utter scandal and it's got to stop. And I thank you so much 
for being open and listening and being so kind today. Very much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Beth. Okay, we'll we'll be in touch with you in, in due course. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight and to keep them there uh, until our next session? Clark, can I ask you to summarise any actions resulting from the briefing? Yes, Chair. Um, so initially, from the closed session, we just had the uh, the action that um, the research is going to be shared um, both with departmental officials and uh, publicly on the committee's website. So just to recap that. Um, then in respect of this session, um, the committee will wish to um, forward some of its parent action information to the department, um, highlighting the uh, the rights framework that was referred to earlier in, in research um, and um, putting a case for progress and policy development in this area. Um, the, the witnesses have said that safeguarding procedures and duties are in place but are not being um, applied or enforced um, and that um, restraint and seclusion are being resorted to um, not as a last resort um, but, but you know, early on for too many children and that they are being um, perceived as therapeutic interventions, which is a misnomer. Um, so the, a rights-based approach um, that each child is entitled to education um, and that um, these are not behavioural issues, but communication um, uh, mechanisms by um, non-neurotypical children and, and that teachers need more um, training um, to enable that communication side of things to develop um, and to be, uh, and they need to be given skills to de-escalate um, when, when a child is trying to communicate um, in these behavioural ways. Um, so there's just a, a shift in mindset. Um, Members referred also to comparative progress that's been made in other jurisdictions. Um, so there's a lot of good practice to be referred to, and a lot, of, you know, clear direction of travel to uh, recommend to the department. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Clark. The the um, papers at page fourteen of table packs include um, the the ten point suggestions that um, Deidre referred to, ref, uh, refer to members, as I say, page 14 and 15 of table packs. Um, I, I think we, we could do well to ask the Department of Education to respond to each of those 10 points if members were content. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and obviously with the, the Clark summary of actions, um, I'm... We, we have our next session is with the Department of Education, um, so I, I want to try and move on promptly here to, to give the, the hour that we have available for that. But do members have any other um, suggested actions or comments further to that session? Content for now. Um, yeah, harrowing, as I think one member said, um, and, and Beth's summary of a, a national human rights scandal should should shock everybody in the action. Members, we, we set our agenda for this committee, so, um, and, it, and it, it's right that this matter has been given priority to us, but can I can I say uh, thank you for for making it um, a priority? Um, we, we have a range of issues to deal with um, on the Education Committee, but, um, um, and, and rightly, the Assembly and the committee Committees are, are criticised and held to account for their scrutiny at times, but um, I'm extremely grateful that, that um, we were able to facilitate the previous evidence session today, um, and, I, and I look forward to our next one with the Department of Education. Members content to agree those actions and, and to move on to our next item then? Agreed? Agreed, okay. Chair. Agreed, Chair. Thank, thank you, members. Okay, move to agenda item seven. Clark, got okay? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay, and ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses. 
Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 209? Briefing papers from the Department of Education in table papers, again. A briefing paper from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission uh, at page 214. Uh, a British Association of Social Workers Northern Ireland briefing paper at page 238. And can I welcome Ricky Irwin, I think, although I don't see him. <laughs> Oh, yes, I do. Die. How you are, Ricky? How are you? Uh, Ricky, Irwin, Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education. Julie Humphreys, Head of Additional Educational Needs Team at the Department of Education. Shauna Collinson, Interim Assistant Director at the Education Authority, Pupil Inclusion, Wellbeing and Protection. Andrea Kelly, Head of Primary Behaviour and Support Provisions at the Education Authority. Um, you're 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 very welcome, uh, witnesses. Uh, I I don't know if you were able to hear our last evidence session or not, but um, harrowing uh, and powerful testimony. Uh, so we we look forward to hearing um, from the department on this um, extremely important issue today. Um, to give you up to ten minutes um, for an opening statement, hand over to you, Ricky. Chair, thank you, and thank you to the committee for inviting the department here today to update you on our review of the use of restraint and seclusion in educational settings. In my opening statement, I wish to set out the background to the decision to undertake a review and to inform the committee of progress to date. We are all working in difficult circumstances, and in taking forward this review, we are acutely aware that children and young people, parents, carers, and school staff who support them are facing a challenging time. Now more than ever, we need to provide clarity on physical intervention, especially when supporting pupils with very complex needs who require this intervention as part of their support plan. The department has not updated its advice in this area since the issue of the DE circular in 1999 entitled Pastoral Care, Guidance on the Use of Reasonable Force to Restrain or Control Pupils, which provides clarification and guidance on the use of reasonable force by teachers and other authorised staff to restrain or control pupils in certain circumstances. It gives guidance about who can use reasonable force, when it is appropriate to use it, and the procedures for recording incidents where reasonable force is used. It also advises that schools should have a written policy about the use of reasonable force that should be made known to parents. Reasonable force should not be used automatically in every situation, nor should it be used as a form of discipline. In a non-urgent situation, it should only be used when other behaviour management strategies have failed as a last resort. Based on the content of the Department Circular, the guidance towards a model policy in schools on the use of reasonable force was issued in 2002. It was developed at that time by a working group including the then Education and Library Boards, the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools, CCMS, and SIA, the Council for Curriculum Examinations and Assessment. It provides guidance on the areas schools should address in developing a policy, whilst recognising each school's individual circumstances and therefore not requiring the adoption of one standardised policy for all. An associated policy framework was further issued by the Department then in 2004. In the intervening time period between the publication of the existing guidance I have described and the recent decision to undertake a review, the Department was not aware of excessive use of restrictive practice or seclusion in schools. There is no legal requirement at present for schools to inform the Department of Incidents and any follow-up. However, more recently, the Minister began to receive correspondence on this issue, including from concerned parents, children's advocates, and the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. It also became apparent that other neighbouring jurisdictions were undertaking work to review existing practice and to publish revised guidance to ensure that the rights of the child are upheld. Taking this into account, during last year, the Minister asked officials to consider the issues of restraint and seclusion, including the appropriateness of existing guidance in partnership with stakeholders and to report back in due course. The paper we have provided to the committee today provides information on how we are approaching this extremely important area of work. As this progresses, we will keep members updated. 
the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, Nicky, and the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman, Nipso, are undertaking a separate review of this issue. We met with Nipso at their request on the 9th of February. My understanding is that both Nicky and Nipso will review information available from schools on restraint and seclusion, including training, guidance, usage and follow through, with processes being assessed against best, best practice and the experience of children and their parents. Officials are currently drafting a timetable work program for completion of this review, which will be presented to the Minister for agreement and will which take account of competing priorities for schools and pupils in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, an engagement plan is also being developed to ensure that the views and experiences of school staff, children, young people and their parents' carers are considered. Details of the timetable for completion will be made available in due course. Chair, in conclusion, we cannot consider the important issue of restraint and seclusion without hearing the, voice, the voices of parents and carers, children and young people, and professionals in health and education, along with governors, other departments and organisations who have experiences in, in this area. We want to get this right. Our children and young people deserve no less. We cannot preempt the outcomes as any recommendations for change should be subject to ministerial approval. I can, however, assure the committee that in seeking to complete this work, we will aim to ensure the outcomes will take cognizance of human rights, be informed by input from appropriate professionals, legal advisors, the Human Rights Commission, the Equality Commission, Nikki, and any other relevant body, including the teaching and non-teaching unions, and be used for the professional development of teachers and other school staff. Chair, that's uh, everything we've got uh, at this point in time. So happy to take any questions that members will have. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ricky. Um, we will straight in. What 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 is your reaction to the the evidence that the education committee heard this morning? Children have been harmed. Parents have been ignored. Trauma has been caused, and one. Uh, witness referred to a national human rights scandal. Chair, we've witnessed um, what has been heard by the committee this morning, and I would completely agree that the evidence um, has been disturbing. Um, uh, it would be anyone in our position, anyone would who heard that would would agree with that assessment. Um, it underscores the importance of the work that we're now taking forward. We see this as an extremely important issue. I can assure you that work is now underway to address um, all those issues. We're listening, we're gathering evidence, um, we're open to submissions on this issue, um, and we want to make sure that we get this right. So um, that's why we are engaging with a number of professional organisations. We plan um, to engage with parents. We're putting together our plans for that now. Um, of course, we want to make sure that there's no inappropriate use of restraint. Um, we need to make sure that schools are fully informed on this issue, that our guidance is up to date. It's quite clear that our policy and our guidance, being over 20 years old, is out of date. Uh, and so we're looking across the other jurisdictions who have recently started to do work on this. We're looking at the evidence um, emerging from those um, nations. We want to build that good practice into our work going forward. Uh, and we want to make um, a series of recommendations to the Minister on how this area needs to be addressed. Okay. Well, you, you said that, you, that the Department of Education was not aware of instances of excessive use of force, I think you said, and I think we could say inappropriate use of restraint and seclusion. Why, why not? And is that not profoundly concerning that the department with responsibility for the education of children and young people is in a position today to say that they were not aware of harm caused to children? Chair, I think that's in the context that there's no legal requirement for schools to report that to either the Education Authority or the Department of Education. I think that, again, highlights the importance of looking at the issue of reporting 
Um, I'm aware of the recommendations that have come forward from the previous witnesses in relation to monetary reporting and recording. These are issues which the working group will, of course, be looking at in detail uh, and will consider the evidence and make appropriate recommendations to the Minister on. Okay, that leads me into the, the recommendations then. Uh, a statutory human rights, children's rights based guidance on positive behaviour, support and restraint and seclusion, mandatory recording and reporting of restraint and seclusion, funded mandatory training for positive behaviour support and accountability framework. Do you, does the Department of Education support those recommendations? I think, I think now that the working group ha has been formed, um, we're gathering evidence in this area uh, and it's quite clear from the work in the other jurisdictions that we've looked at that there are many themes emerging which include those particular issues, not least the need for a child-centred approach, for a needs-based uh, approach um, and one which is centred um, within the rights of the child. So I think it's important for Northern Ireland not to be out of step with um, the rest of the UK and other jurisdictions. So of course we will give those very serious consideration. Okay. Um, we will want to gather evidence from many professional organisations um, on those areas and we will want to try and get this right. So um, I mean the message I suppose is that we're, we're looking at those recommendations, we're gathering evidence across those various aspects, okay. including training for staff and they will all be uh, part of the work of the working group. Okay, and from whom are you gathering evidence and does that include parents, the like of whom we have heard from today? I, I don't think we could do this without engaging with parents. That's, that's a simple fact. Um, we have uh, established a, re a working group which has various policy leads within the department, but it also has the Education and Training Inspectorate in an advisory role. We also have um, other departments who are looking uh, at these matters, including the Department of Health and the Department of Justice. So that's the working group. But alongside that chair, we are in the process of establishing a reference group of professional organisations. So that will include um, NICI, the Children's Law Centre, the British Association of Social Workers, who I know the committee has heard from um, before, the Human Rights Commission. So there are various organisations there that we have some of which we have already engaged with on a one-to-one -one, but we will want to get the, them together as a group as quickly as possible we're trying to get a date for that first meeting in march when we get that we um, also then want to be taking forward our engagement with um, parents carers um, children schools and unions so we are putting our plans together for that engagement now uh, I just don't have the dates of those particular meetings at this point. Why? Why is it taking so long, Ricky? In what? In what respect? We've we've heard from parents uh, today. We've heard coordinated, coherent proposals from them. Why? Why has the Department of Education not done that? Well, the department is taking this work forward, Chair. Now. Have, have, which which parents have you engaged with? So, as I, as I explained, we have formed a working group. We are forming a reference group, and we are putting our plans for engagement with parents, schools, uh, and children together now. So that work is underway. As you know, Chair, I'm here on a regular basis on many com competing priorities, including SAM, health and well-being, looked after children, and so on. So, of course. We have a finite amount of people in the team. We have a limited amount of time. So we are bringing this forward in the context of many competing priorities, Chair. I think other members will want to come in on that, so I'll allow them uh, to to do so. Um, I, I I first raised this with the Education Minister further to the re-establish of, of the Assembly in February 2020. Didn't realise that until I checked today. That's a year ago. Um, the children that experienced harm needed this quicker and the children who need positive behaviour support rather than harm need you to move quicker as well. But uh, grateful for the, the update uh, this morning and for your answers so far.
uh, look forward to the questions from other members. And on that note, can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ricky, and uh, the rest of your officials there with you. Um, and you've been using a lot of the of the right language here this morning. You know, talking about uh, the the rights of the child and so on. And, and you obviously uh, share the concerns that have been uh, voiced in the committee today, and the, the the concerns of the parents and the advocacy groups and so on. But I get I get a bit concerned when I hear that the chair of the committee raised this with the minister a year ago, and then I hear you saying there's a working group uh, and there's a reference group going to be established and meetings are going to happen in March. So give us a timeline when you expect, you know, something concrete at the end of this. Pat, thanks for that. Um, look, there's an urgency around all of this work. Um, there is no doubt, uh, particularly when you hear the evidence uh, and the evidence that we're gathering as well. Um, I would love to put a deadline on this and say to you this morning or this afternoon now that um, this would be done by a certain date. Um, I, I can't because until we get into the detail of these issues, until we engage with parents um, and schools and professional organisations and fully scope out what needs to be done and fully understand the extent of what's been done in other jurisdictions and the best practice, um, I, I'm unable to put a final date on that. But I can assure you that we are moving forward with this as quickly as we can. I don't want to do this so quickly that we don't get it right. It's important that we, we, we do this right. But um, I would have liked to have started this before now. Um, this issue was raised with me at the time, shortly after the minister came in the office. And then uh, at that time, shortly afterwards, we had um, COVID-19. So um, we've been involved in many issues around vulnerable children since then, and SEN and health and wellbeing, as you know. So we're trying to bring this forward as quickly as we can, I can assure you. OK. Uh, and. I mean, you, you accept it's an urgent issue, but explain to me what has been done over the past year since this was first brought to the attention of the Minister. So we have uh, formed a working group. We've met four times. We have identified... Who's on, who's on the working group? Sorry. Okay, so the working group is chaired by myself, Pat, with members of relevant policy officials within the department, along with the Education and Training Inspectorate, who will have a role in all of this, and also the Departments of Health and Justice. And how many times has that group met? So we, ha we have had four meetings so far. And what have been the outcomes of those four meetings? So we have commissioned various pieces of work um, around gathering evidence, Pat, in relation to what's happening in other jurisdictions, uh, examining the correspondence that we have received on this issue. We've engaged with the British Association of social workers, we have identified members of the reference group, we have all those organisations and named individuals, we are now engaging with them to get a date tied down for the meeting of that group. And we are also putting together our engagement plan about how we engage with parents, carers, unions and school staff as well. So, um, sorry, I should have mentioned as well, of course, the Education Authority are on that group too. Okay. And tell me, um... Uh, has any interim guidance uh, been given to schools on how they should deal with issues of restraint uh, and seclusion, given the fact that the current guidance only deals with it in the context of good order and discipline and doesn't deal with it in the context of uh, additional needs of, of children, you know, particularly those who are nonverbal, who have communication difficulties and so on? So any, any interim guidance, given the concerns that you have voiced this morning, your acceptance that this is an urgent issue that needs to be dealt with, uh, has any interim guidance been offered? Pat, no, no interim guidance at this stage. Um, that has not been raised with us. We, of course, want to make sure that the guidance we put out is correct. And I think to get that right, we need to be engaging with those organisations and parents and so on. So we, that's why there's an urgency around yeah, this. You've said, you've said you've engaged with the British Association of Social Workers. 
and yep. they raised this issue of the current guidance uh, only being in the context of good order and discipline. Yep. Uh, so surely they have flagged that up to you that there, there's, there's a need for a change in the guidance. And do you not think it would be the sensible thing to do, given the concerns that you have voiced yourself, given the evidence that this committee has heard about harm being done to children, both physical uh, and psychological trauma had, that has been visited on them, do you not think, and given the urgency of this situation, that it would be a good idea to issue some interim guidance at the moment, or at least to flag up with schools the difficulties and the problems that have been raised with this committee and that the chair of the committee uh, has raised with the minister uh, over a year ago? Well, I think that's something that we'll have to go away and look at very seriously. I mean, I'm aware that the Public Service Ombudsman are carrying out a review jointly with the Children's Commissioner. Uh, and so it would be important for me that any recommendations coming out of their work are built into ours. So I, I would like to try and move forward together with the relevant organisations on this, but I, I will take that away and, and, and consider that. Okay, and, and just one final question, Chair, if you'll just indulge me on this. Do you agree that the current guidelines, uh, current guidance is totally unsatisfactory? Absolutely, completely. It's date. It's pitched in the context of discipline, of use of reasonable force. Um, for me, uh, there needs to be a shift away from that. It needs to be around positive behavioural um, strategies. Uh, it needs to be child-centred. It needs to be reflective of the needs of the child and understanding that behaviour is a form of communication, Pat. So, um, if we were uh, writing this from scratch, which effectively is what we're going to be doing, it won't look anything like the current guidance that is out there. There are gaps. I mean, we don't. There is nothing in there around seclusion or isolation. Um, the department's guidance has been silent on that. So, of course, we need to look at that as well. Fair enough, and I'll, I'll finish on this. Uh, you haven't been able to give us a timeline when you'll be able to complete this piece of work, but can can you tell us? when you'll be in a position to do that? Um, I will be better informed after our first meeting uh, with the professional organisations. So uh, what I would say is that when we have our engagement plan agreed, then we will hopefully have a timetable and a timeline. So I assure you that once I have that, I'll bring that back to the committee and share that with you. And have you any idea when that'll be? Um, well, we are we we have meetings scheduled for on a bi-monthly basis at the minute. It it really will depend on the nature of the work and the extent of the work that comes out of this. And I simply, I simply don't know. I simply don't know what we're going to be asked to do and by when and how how much effort and resource that's going to require, Pat. So, um, as quickly as possible. I mean, I have scheduled this for the rest of this year. If it can be done before then, it will be. If it takes longer, it, it, it may take longer. It depends on also what the minister uh, obviously wants to do, and we will be presenting all these recommendations to him for final decision. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Thank, thanks, Pat. I mean, glaring the obvious question here, Ricky, is why in 2021 the Department of Education is able to accept the the guidance is so unfit for purpose, but I'll bring other MLAs in. Um, Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to your guests from the department. It's always very interesting to hear some of the contributions in the department, but what, 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 what frustrates me, Ricky, is when we unnecessarily, without justification, blame coronavirus for an issue that predated the pandemic. You know, the last guidance was written in 1999. There was no sign of the pandemic in 1999. What has taken so long to address this issue? So I'm not accepting blaming coronavirus. I don't want to hear that again from the department. I've been very clear about that because it's insulting. So 
that's me being blunt about that. I, I find it very frustrating when a Department for Education tries to find excuses to justify its lack of movement on these important issues. The chair has been very clear. He raised this a year ago, a year ago. And look, what's even more frustrating is that the, the, the restraint and seclusion group only met in October. October 2020. What has taken so long? And what I also don't want to hear is that the department are running for your feet. The Department for Education is one of the best resourced departments in government. And surely you could find somebody to lead on this issue. So I'm not, I'm not in the mood to accept excuses from the Department of Education on something that the chair of this committee and the members of this committee have clearly stated as a priority issue. So let's get on with the work instead of making excuses. That's the first point. I have a few questions now, but I find that frustrating. Uh, and I'm going to put that very clearly because families are suffering due to the inactivity of this department and they're failing families and children everywhere. And it's not acceptable. And I'm making that very clear. It has to change. Show a bit of leadership. And the final point as well, Ricky, you know, this really frustrated me at this point, that you have to write the guides from scratch. Everything that this education minister has done to date has copied England. So what's the difference in this occasion? There's written guidance, there's written guidance there that could be used. Uh, and there's best examples that has been worked on in, in Scotland and Wales as well. But to skip the question, Chair, um, taking matters forward, what plans do the Department have to work in harmony with the Department of Health? That's vitally important, Rick, and we've made that point. It would appear to me that a very close working relationship would be essential. Uh, for example, similar professional practices to take forward a positive behaviour support approach. How does the Department see this happen? Well, Daniel, um, I'm sorry that you feel that way uh, in terms of your views about how seriously the department has taken this. Um, I've been very frank with you. We have been moving forward with this as quickly as we can. And as soon as I was asked to act on this, I have acted on this. And what I have explained are the facts in terms of our response to COVID-19. So I'm not making any excuses around any of that. Um, I explained that we are working very closely with the Department of Health who are involved in our working group. Health are looking at the use of restricted practices within health settings. That, of course, has a read across in terms of, we're, of what we are doing. We want to make sure that we're aligned with their work. So we're working both with them and the Department of Justice, who also have an interest in this area as well. Uh, and it is our intention to make sure that we bring this work forward as quickly as we can. And of course, we're going to use what is available from the other jurisdictions and many of them have produced papers, Scottish Commissioner, Ofsted in England, um, recent guidance from the Department for Education in England. We will want to use all of that where we can. So I'm giving you the assurance that we're doing the best that we can on this particular issue. Ricky, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you probably not accept my direct and very blunt uh, criticism. But on a daily basis, I'm hearing from families that are genuinely struggling and I mean genuinely struggling and finding it very tough. And we have to understand that schools have been out for the bulk of this year. There is plenty of people in the department that could have done more to speed up this process. And I'm going to labour that point as heavily and as bluntly as I can. And it's not up for debate. This should have been resolved sooner and it should have been acted or moved on a lot sooner. And I hope that when this comes back to this committee, that there is significant movement in this regard because it is very clearly a priority for each of the members that represent each of the core parties of the Assembly, and we're making that very clear as a result of representations made to us. I have a final point, Chair. Uh, it has been reported to us that right across the UK, the mental health uh, and social care settings have been much more proactive um, in seeking to reduce reliance on restrictive interventions than the education sector. Can you tell us why the Department for Education has lagged behind um, and also, will you be committing uh, dedicated resources to train and upskill teachers? We've raised that point with you in the last occasion. And will the C2K system or its replacement be enabled to facilitate the compiling of records in relation to restraint and seclusion in a systematic and uniform way? Daniel, thanks. As, as I've explained, we, we of course, are wanting um, to bring ourselves in line with what's happening in the rest uh, of um, the other jurisdictions. We're also looking at what's happening in the South as well. So it is my intention that we learn from the um, work that has gone on there and we uh, build that into our work going forward. Training is one of the 
issues. Training for staff is one of the issues that we've identified. Um, we, of course, will want to engage with um, the unions on that as well. Um, and we'll want to consider what has happened in other jurisdictions in terms of how that training has been brought forward, what that training looks like, and what supporting guidance for staff um, needs to be developed. And um, what was your, your last point there again? The, la the last point was around C2K. Now, we know that it's far from yeah. a perfect system, to put it politely, um, but uh, will, 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 will the C2K system or its replacement be able to facilitate the compiling of records in relation to... Does it at the moment, Julie? Do you know? No, it doesn't have to be, no. It could be any kind of recording. We, we don't want to make it mandatory. Do you want to answer that? Can I? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, look, in terms of C2K and its replacement, we'll need to check the specification on that. But in terms of what happens at the minute, Julie might be able to, to provide some more information on that. Yeah, so at, records are kept at school level and they can um, schools can use any method to record um, incidents if we were to require them to use C2K, if that was one of the recommendations from the working group, then we'll look at that issue. If we were to make that mandatory, then we need to be sure that every setting has access to C2K, including preschool. Um, we'll take it away um, and talk to um, our working group members. EA members are here today, and um, Shauna and Andrea may have some um, comment on that as well. Yep, Shauna, Andrew, do you like the comment? Not sure if we can hear you. I think we're having problems with the sound from. Shauna, you can go to the more button and down to your AV settings and um, adjust the uh, volume of your microphone. Daniel, do you want to respond to um, that yeah. feedback you received there before we bring the EA witnesses in? Thanks. If we're going to have a uniform system, Chair, uh, in relation to uh, reporting, that it must be done from the top, it must be done from the top down. Uh, and, uh, otherwise, we'll have a thousand schools doing entirely different things, and the record keeping will be far from perfect. Uh, and certainly, will there be questions about whether they adhere to the guidance that will be eventually issued? Um, but Chair, I have a very final point, and I think this is important as well. Um, in terms of supporting children with SEN in schools, uh, it happens in two very different contexts, uh, 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 as we know, special schools and mainstream schools. Can you assure us that in taking this matter forward, we will take both contexts into account and provide for both of them? Uh, because there, there's quite a lot of children now in mainstream schools that will require uh, that support, not just uh, in terms of uh, special schools. Daniel, yes, and um, when we intend this work to cover all all settings, um, all phases, uh, and um, mainstream and special schools, um, of course, uh, the context of SEN and additional educational needs is very important here. As you know, we're bringing forward a new SEN framework, uh, and there's a program of work that the EA are bringing forward in terms of improving SEN um, practice uh, and support. So this guidance uh, and policy that's developed in this area will be cognizant of all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. No problem. Education Authority witnesses, do we have noise from you there? I'm hoping so. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah. Right yeah. Do you want to come in on that question with regards to the capacity for C2K to be a, a uniform system for uh, mandatory recording? Should that be put in place? Um, yes, and, and we will be able to come back with some detail. Um, I suppose to say that the use of SIMS by schools in EOTA settings would be promoted as good practice for recording any incidents where restrictive practice is used and any of the follow-up taken place, and that, again, good practice that is promoted should be through um, the Board of Governors or Service Management monitoring the number of incidents and the, and the responses. Um, I think that um, you know it's important to acknowledge that any incident with restrictive practice is incredibly distressing for the child involved and that the approaches through through training, through the Education Authority Behaviour Support Services, the approaches that are, are promoted and, and capacity built within schools 
very much focus on the child-centered approach, nurturing approaches, trauma-informed approaches, and making sure that the environment that the young people are learning within and that the, the staff um, who are, are delivering their lessons and supporting them within the school environment um, are, are using those strategies as a preventative and, and early intervention um, method, but also as, as a, um, a full school or full setting ethos. Um, I, I don't know, it might be helpful for the committee if, if Andrea spoke to some of the, the training modules that are offered by the authority to schools currently um, to yes, ensure yeah. that staff are skilled. Thanks for that, Shauna. Just before I bring Andrea in, um, that it sounds like we're we're starting to hear about some good practice, which is helpful. Um, you, you did you say Sims is used by um, EOGA settings? Could you tell us exactly what that is? Well, Sims is, is the management system within all all schools and educational settings um, where where schools would um, input attendance, for example, um, and then then good practice again would be around progress updates or or behaviour within schools um, and holds the records really for each individual child um, across the school community. Um, there will be variance in practice, there will be variance in, in, in inputs there, but certainly good practice would be that records are stored there and that reports can be um, run regularly from the system at the individual school level. Um, and, and follow up to, to Daniel's question, then there is infrastructure in place there that that could be used for the purposes of um, mandatory recording and reporting of instances then, yeah? Yes, at a school-based or setting-based level, yes. Okay, and, and the oldest are demonstrating some good practice in that regard. That, that, that is positive. It does, however, beg why it is not um, ruled out um, further afield. Daniel, do you, do you want to come in very briefly? Yeah, I appreciate that. Your, we don't have your audio. Sorry, I'm clicking unmute and something else is clicking mute. Right. Uh, someone's going to react there. But, uh, uh, yeah, we do need to, I go back to the original point, we need a uniform system so that there's sufficient recording in all schools, not just some, uh, okay. in order to properly monitor this. Uh, and uh, whilst they take that it's happening in some, that that, that isn't going to be sufficient in the, in the long term. We, we need to get to a place where there's okay. a system where every school can record onto the one database and then we can have a clear picture of what is happening. Okay. Shauna, uh, I, I think uh, Nicola Brogan, MLA, may have a question with regards to training, so perhaps I could um, bring Andre in um, up for, for Nicola's question and at this stage move to Robbie Butler uh, and as I say, um, I think we'll cover that when, when Nicola comes in, if that's okay, just in the, in the interest of time. Um, Robbie okay. Butler? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, very often, Ricky, you've been in front of us a few times, and sometimes we do the good cop, bad cop routine, but there are, are, are no, no good cops in this one because the, the committee is absolutely resolute in terms of its and how it's facing this pressure. Um, and it is quite stark, and I know you, you, you've listened in attentively, and you've only maybe been in office a, a short while, Ricky. So, uh, but, but I'm going to reach into the timeline a little bit here to try and go back and discover why we are where we are, whilst I know there's some good work ongoing. Um, Daniel quite rightly has said COVID is not an excuse. Um, we also had the, the three years where we didn't have ministerial direction, which is quite unforgivable for many reasons. However, um, the BBC reports predate that even, um, you know, that, that really drew these things into uh, everybody's attention across the UK. Um, so if, if England were able to move in 2015, if Scotland were able to move in around the same time and Wales even were able to move in 2019, was this seriously not on a risk register? Um, had this not been raised by either a minister previous to um, Storm being brought down, um, and was it not on even the parent secretaries uh, to look at? Um, and if it wasn't, why do you believe that to be the case? Um, Robbie, I suppose child protection and safeguarding issues uh, are always uh, a priority within the department and indeed uh, a key risk on, on the department's corporate risk register. So um, making sure that our policies and procedures uh, are up to date in terms of the protection of children um, is is always uh, at the forefront of our work. There, there, are, there are also existing legislative um, 
there's legislation in place in, in relation to the safeguarding and promoting of the welfare uh, of pupils at school and also in terms of deciding on the measures to be taken to protect pupils and the need for schools to have statements and policies uh, in place. So, I mean, the frameworks which exist, um, it's not that this has not been uh, in a vacuum. Uh, I think the issue, and I'm not here to try uh, and defend the actions of people before me, um, I think um, the issue has been there. Uh, it hasn't been taken forward um, until I was asked by the minister to take this forward. I don't know the timeline before me. I would have to go and check um, in the individual um, circumstances before me as to when uh, issues of this nature had been raised. But I can assure you that safeguarding and child protection has always been at the forefront of the department's work. Okay, um, I appreciate that, Mickey. Um, um, I think it's it's. it's to ensure that we can learn lessons to make sure that the, in terms of the prioritisation of the safety of all of our children uh, and the well-being is, is at forefront. Um, in terms of, so the Minister has uh, given this piece of work to do, did, did he set out any terms, terms of reference or, or did he scope it in any way in terms of giving a, a leader his desires and what he would like to see coming? I'm thinking particularly, well, in some ways I'm thinking particularly about how it's going to be constructed in terms of the mandatory functions, so like mandatory and that type of stuff, because I just don't want them to get off on the wrong foot here um, and, and it be corralled in some way that we are not aware of, Ricky? Um, no, I mean, uh, the the brief is fairly open, to be fair, um, Robbie. Uh, you know, what we need to do is to examine issues in this area and come back with recommendations. Um, there is a term to reference for the working group. I think, in fact, it has been shared with this committee before now. Um, I think the committee asked for it, so you have got the detail of that. It sets out um, our broad approach. Um, it doesn't have a timeline on it. I've tried to explain that uh, we obviously want to do this as quickly as possible, but I can't set a date until we get further into the detail of the issue and until we start to engage with the relevant organisations. So um, we will go back with policy advice to the minister as quickly as we can. And then the final decision will, will be his in terms of uh, what we need to take forward. I mean, Pat has raised, rightly so, the issue of whether we need to make changes now to guidance in some kind of interim form. And I think that's a legitimate request that we need to consider um, in conjunction with members of the working group and with the Education Authority. So we, we will take that one away and look at that. I think, I think that uh, suggestion that Pat was was, was actually going to make it myself because even in terms of updating schools and carers and parents of the ongoing work might give some confidence and also might drive out and, and might tease out some best practice never mind re, you know giving people the confidence to actually say also what's been going on because we need that that candor if you like to ensure that we re, reach everybody here this is just a final question guys um because the, the questions you've faced so far have been very good and the members have been very good with this with regard to the reference group then um, our parent action, uh, one of your uh, groups that will be part of that reference group? They're not, they're not named on the reference group, but it's our intention to uh, engage with, with parent groups. Uh, and so we're very happy to engage with parent action. They, they haven't approached us at this stage. Okay, could I, could I just suggest that maybe, um, I'm sure they'll be watching, but if, if you wouldn't mind reaching out, I would really appreciate that, guys. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks Robbie. Uh, Ricky, I, I don't think it's adequate to say they haven't approached you. You're, you're the department conducting the review. Approach them. Um, that's, that's, that's your role. Um, a quick other follow-up question. Um, it's my understanding, that, and, and, and follow-up to, to Robbie's question in regards to timeline, and look, to, to be fair and obviously reasonable, um, you, you personally can't account retrospectively for timescales involved here, but it would be remiss of the committee to not ask the department to give account in relation to the timescales involved here. And it's my understanding that the Department of Education potentially declined to join a Department of Health review of its policy on restraint and seclusion in January 2020 the outcome of which is due to publish next month. Is, did the Department of Education decline to join a Department of Health review on its policy on restraint and, and seclusion in January 2020? A uh, simple answer, Chair, is I don't know. Okay. I, don't know. I, fair, that, that, I think that's a fair enough answer, but can we get an answer to that question then, please? 
And if the department did decline to join that review, who took that decision? Okay. So, look, just to add to that, it, it's important to stress that we have the Department of Health on our working group um, and that we are working closely with them in terms of their work and we want to make sure that we're aligned with their work on the use of restrictive practices. So um, I don't want the message to the committee to be that we're not engaging with the Department of Health because that's not the case. I, I think given the advanced nature of their work, um, you, you, it would be uh, it would be a massive error not to. Indeed, it looks like you had that opportunity in January 2020, and we look forward to hearing an answer to that particular question. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please? Thank you, Chair. And first of all, thanks to everybody for um, attending here today and for giving the updates and answering our questions. Um, I'd like to reiterate exactly what every other member has said, that I actually can't believe that the Department has not issued any updated advice or guidance since 1999. That's what, 22 years ago or thereabouts. Um, it's no wonder that the families we heard from today feel overlooked and utterly neglected and that their voice isn't being heard. Um, so I'm glad that you know we are discussing it now and I hope that from this will be a lot of forward movement. Um, I can't believe that the chair brought this up last year and it's still only being discussed now. Um, one of my main concerns is, as I've already mentioned in the last session, is the fact that there is no mandatory incident recording um, or reporting to parents. Um, I think that's just so shocking and such a concern because given the evidence that we heard earlier today and I've heard previously, I think some of these incidents incidents um, could border on abuse, and we won't actually know that until we get um, some proper like monitoring and reporting procedures. So I'd just like to make that their point. Um, I'm glad to hear, Ricky, that you said you're engaging with parents um, to implement the changes necessary. Can you tell me how, if you have or if you plan to engage with teachers, school leaders, um, all staff involved with um, the care of children and in particular children with additional needs? I think that the simple answer to that is yes, we, we do intend to engage with all of those groups. Um, we want to take advice um, from our reference group in terms of how best to do that, but we are putting together our plans for engagement now and I've said previously that you know I'm happy to share that with this committee once we have tied um, all that down. There are many, many um, groups and organisations um, who will want um, to hear or to want to have their voice heard in this process and we're very happy to engage um, with all of those. I think um, it's important to say as well, because it maybe hasn't come out so far in the session, there are many schools out there who are doing a lot of good work in this area and we want to hear about that good practice and we want to capture that and we want to share that more widely across the education um, system. Um, it's not um, necessarily uh, all bad uh, news. Um, there is a lot of work that goes unseen in the background that needs to be reflected. And many teachers and schools do a lot of important work in this area. And indeed, the Education Authority, in terms of its behavioural support staff, and Andrea uh, is there today, and, and maybe she can give us a wee bit of an update on it. They provide a lot of support to schools in that important work. So perhaps I could invite Andrea to give us a bit of a, an update on that, if that's OK, Chair. Is that OK, Nicola? Yeah, um, we'll do that. Yeah, I'd just like to make the point, absolutely, um, there are schools and staff within schools that are doing a great job, and we definitely appreciate that. But today is about listening to parents and um, those that have experienced uh, experienced these incidents and to hearing from them. So it's not that we are neglecting to um, accept or understand the good work the schools are doing, you know. But yes, go ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Nick. Let's bring Andrea in there. Thanks, Andrea. Good afternoon, um, Chair and committee members. Um, in relation to uh, the EAS Behaviour Support uh, Services support to schools, um, at the moment, uh, the Behaviour Support Services offer a range of whole school and bespoke 
um, training for schools that really encourages schools to establish an early intervention preventative trauma-informed and nurture approaches to supporting behaviours that challenge and promote a culture of positive emotional health and well-being and coming from a perspective of understanding behaviour as a form of communication. Um, training that would be available um, would be looking at establishing um, a whole school nurture approach. Um, it would be looking at um, understanding and managing um, children that present with social emotional behavioural problems. There would be bespoke training for classroom assistants, which would look at uh, planning support arrangements for pupils that they are directly involved with, um, building resilience, and also reconnecting um, relationships as well. There would also be training available around a positive approach to risk assessment and the development of risk reduction action plans. There is also training around de-escalation and diffusion and managing children in crisis. So there is a range of very bespoke training programs for schools, for individual staff members, and also uh, for whole school as well. And maybe just to, to speak further on what uh, Ricky had mentioned about the, the examples of good practice that is out there, uh, probably one thing that comes to mind is in respect to a pilot program that uh, behavior support services have been taken forward with some special schools in one locality area where they have been looking at their own approach to supporting their staff to manage behaviors that challenge within their school, to upskill their staff members, to actually give staff members an opportunity to say, this is the areas that we need more support uh, and how, how um, can we best support the children that are in our care. And that particular um, pilot is supported by uh, behaviour support staff and um, the schools have ownership of its content and of the framework that is used uh, within their school environment. And uh, following a recent meeting with uh, special school principals, we're looking at developing that uh, framework with other special schools in another locality area. So th there are definitely examples, uh, good practice examples out there where schools um, are, are taking a more trauma-informed, preventative early intervention approach to supporting behaviour. And probably the other thing I would maybe like to just mention um, is the revised um, SEN resource file chapter on um, SBEW, which takes that very approach that behaviour is um, it's about nurturing emotional health and well-being, and that is a major cultural shift from what we have uh, been speaking about earlier in respect to the, the guidance uh, that schools are currently working to. Thank you for that, Andrea. Um, um, I'm glad that you know there's so much, um, or there seems to be so much um, uh, resources being put, and put into the training. We heard from another um, parent of a child who experienced um, restraint and seclusion, who actually, after all was said and done, didn't blame the staff at all because they were aware that the staff actually weren't trained in the matter and knew no better. So didn't blame the staff members for what had actually happened to their child, which I thought was a very kind of noble um, way to deal with it. But it was actually reflective too of, of um, it was accurate, you know, of what actually had been done. Um, can I just ask you finally, um, would it be right to maybe suggest that this kind of training should be included within annual CPD hours, like uh, so like actual mandatory requirements for CPD hours for teachers and teaching staff? I, um, can I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that then, and if Andrea or the EA want to come in on the back. Um, I think uh, there are many asks uh, in terms of training for teachers, uh, and it's a, it's a very, um, it's a congested, um, Time frame in terms of trying to get everything um, squeezed in for teachers. Uh, I think we need to engage further with our colleagues in the department around teacher training and whether that can be built in as continuous professional development and how best to do that. We want to, of course, look like, at what's happening in other jurisdictions on that um, issue as well. And if it can be done, we certainly will explore it. Yeah, but I definitely think it's something you should be engaging with because it's obviously so important and we all heard the testimonies today. Um, it, it needs to be changed. 
Absolutely. But thank you very much for your time and thank you, Chair. Hi, thanks for that, Nicola. I, I think that question does point us towards what um, what influence a, a fragmented a uh, system that has been in financial distress for so many years um, that struggles to deliver the type of support in CPD that teachers need has has actually had on these outcomes and this harm. Um, and, and we will have to set our gaze higher um, beyond ju uh, just the new framework that absolutely needs to be put in place towards the reform the fundamental reform of the education system to be less fragmented, to be better resourced and to have more time and, and resources for CPD and support for teachers as well. Um, can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, folks, for your evidence. Um, can I just clarify, guidance hasn't been updated since 1989 or 1999. So, uh, Justin, there was guidance in 1999, followed up by further guidance in 2002 and 2004. Okay. Um, in terms of the figures from the BBC uh, research, 13,000 um, cases of restrictive intervention and 731 incidents of the injury to those children. That's 6%. Would you say there's an equivalent percentage here? I couldn't. I couldn't answer that. Justin, the department uh, doesn't get but the you don't information. Have that data. You don't have that data anyway. So, um, is it safe to say that there would be an equivalent percentage here? Assume. I couldn't. I couldn't make that assumption. I, I mean, I just. I don't have anything to base that on. Uh, the education authority does gather some information, but it's in relation to EOTIS settings only. So, I think. I mean, what it does underscore is the importance of. Um, recording of information um, as part of this process and what we need to do in that area. So um, we will be looking at that. Okay, fundamentally, are we look, are, is what we're looking at here really just a case of evidence of discrimination against children with disabilities? Well, there shouldn't be any discrimination against children with disabilities or saying, I mean, that's, that's uh, underpinned by legislation. Um, including departmental legislation so that simply shouldn't be happening well it appears that through the lack of legislation to protect these children that it seems like it's just okay for disabled children so they don't really need the protection that kids who haven't got the haven't got disabilities have that this has gone on for so long to me that demonstrates evidence of discrimination against children with disabilities well, how, how, can the department, how can the department defend my assertion? It's certainly not okay. For the assertion. It's, it's, cer it's certainly not okay, um, Justin, and that's why the department has legislation out there in relation to protecting children with SAN and disabilities against discrimination. So, um, you know, we are strong on ensuring that schools follow the guidance, uh, the statutory guidance that's out there. As you know, we're updating the same framework with new statutory guidance and a new code of practice, and those messages will continue to be highlighted within that guidance. Well, I, I don't accept that, Ricky. Um, these, these are all nice platitudes and positive words about what's, what's in place and what's, what's going to happen, uh, committees being set up. If this, was, if this was children who don't have disabilities, who are being treated like this over such a long period for, such a, for so many years, this wouldn't be happening. But because they're children with disabilities, it's okay. And that's discrimination. That's not acceptable. And the, the, the department is responsible, and the department needs to post haste get this sorted out. So the children with disabilities are taken care of even more carefully than those without. I, I, don't, dis I don't disagree with what you're saying, and it's, and it's not okay. Thanks very much, folks. Okay. Th thank you, Justin. Um, well, this is ju Justin raises some important points there. The, the BBC Five Live investigated restraint in special schools in 2017, um, and it gathered some quite concerning data. Um, re our research briefing tells us that the, the BBC investigation submitted the same request to the Northern Irish Education Authority um, for, with regards to incidents of physical restraint 
an injury and that the education authority stated in its reply that it was the responsibility of individual schools to record any incidents of restraint and seclusion and as a result the data is not held centrally okay. it would be it would be interesting to know to whom in the education authority that request was submitted um did it did it not raise any concern that a bbc investigation was asking it to consider this issue and did it not prompt it in any way to think that maybe it ought to gather the data Chair, um, I'm, I'm not sure on, on what date that information was requested or, or, or where if the response um, you know, has come from ourselves, but certainly our response would be that we don't hold that data centrally. There is not currently um, a, a process or, or expectation that the Education Authority holds the data of special schools centrally. We do hold the data of, um, of our IOTA centres, our education other than school centres, um, as they're under our service management, but the, the data at special school level is held by the, the Board of Governors and is not reported into us um, on any central central uh, database or process. I think that's maybe something for us to return to. Um, okay, members, we're, we're out, of, out of time. Um, Ricky, Julie, Shona and Andrea, can I, I thank you for your time with us today. Um, I think there is a, a, an acknowledgement that there have been feelings and that there is a, an immediate need to put um, up-to-date, fit-for-purpose guidance uh, in place. Um, and we've had clear recommendations today that that needs to be on a statutory footing, that it needs to involve mandatory recording and reporting, mandatory training, among some other key recommendations, and we'll be writing to the department to get a more detailed response on those recommendations. But, Ricky, in, in closing, you'll accept there is no time whatsoever to waste in the work of that working group, and, and we look forward to uh, receive an update as the progress on it. Okay? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, members, uh, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and ask the clerk to summarise any actions uh, coming from that briefing? Okay, members, um, I think we've got a letter coming um, to the department and then also one to the Education Authority um, for clarification of some of the points you have raised. Um, so, in respect of DE, initially, um, we want to know what the rationale is for um, the department's inaction, um, given that Scotland, Wales and England have been able to action this um, in 2015 and 2019, respectively. Um, asking for a timeline um, to uh, like ban some of these practices, um, deliver new guidance and roll out training. Um, reiterate the question about um, whether interim guidance has been issued, given the urgency of this matter. Clarifying uh, what action was taken when the chairperson raised the matter with the minister in February 2020, um, asking whether the department can communicate to schools uh, what was said just now that the, the guidance is out of date and couched in inappropriate terminology, such as uh, reasonable force. Um, providing, um, asking to provide an engagement plan and timetable of de deliverables for the working group and reference group. Um, in terms of reference uh, for the work of the reference group. So we already have terms of reference for the working group, but not the reference group. Um, then Daniel made um, a point about um, using C2K to rule out access and to guidance and, and training. Um, and we would like more information from the EA on um, SIMS and the, the system um, uh, infrastructure that could be used in that respect. Um, recommend that parent action be included in the reference group. Um, as, recommend that to pre preclude discrimination against children who are not uh, neurotypical, that the working group and um, reference group address the complexity of um, what needs to be done in both mainstream and special school settings. Um, 
Asking um, the specific question, did the department decline in January 2020 to join a Department of Health review on restraint and seclusion policy? Who um, took that decision and what was the basis for it? Um, and then for the EA, we just had two more. Um, so they outlined um, that there are materials and there are there is training on whole school and nurture approach, de-escalation training, emotional communication training and early intervention materials. Um, and there are, are promotional materials for trauma-informed preventative and supporting um, uh, skills in, um, in, in dealing with um, difficult behaviours in the classroom. Um, the committee recommends that those are rewarded and perhaps with accredited CPD hours and uh, that that should be prioritised. Um, and also then who in the Education Authority replay, replied to the BBC Five Live request um, for uh, records um, back in 2017 um, and why nothing else was done then at that point. Members content? Agreed. Members back in the spotlight there, okay, yeah. No? Yes, no, we are now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Members want to come in? Chair, sure. come in. Okay, sorry, we'll second. I'll, I'll let Pat come in and then we'll go to Daniel, I think, there. Yeah, Pat. Yeah. I think that was a fairly comprehensive summary from me, I I can't think of anything that was left out. Thanks, Pat. Daniel? Yeah, and just a number of points of clarification, Aideen. Uh, I want the system, I requested that there's a system, a uniform system that records all um, uh, events of seclusion or, or restraint across all schools. Uh, just that there's a clear recording, and that's why I suggested maybe C2K or whatever replaces it uh, would be the best way of doing that. So just to be very clear about that, uh, other ways it was different schools doing different things, and it won't be in tandem with what we're trying to achieve. And we need we need common data as well. Okay. So okay. Just a another point. Uh, um, well, they always appreciate the time of, of any official from the Department of Education in providing an insight as to what's going on. It really does cause a huge amount of frustration when they're finding excuses as to why they haven't uh, actioned various things. Uh, you know, today was a very clear example. Um, a year ago, this was raised, no action, took to October before the group met, um, you know, they even made a point, there, there was just so many things I jotted in there. They even made a point about um, the, the, the protection of children uh, as a top priority for them, you know, the, 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 in this regard. But how could it be when they've left this so long and, and done very little? Um, so I just wasn't overly impressed uh, with the department. But I have to say, uh, our other guests uh, today were exceptional. The presentation this morning, the research carried out, was very, very helpful, very good. Uh, a lot of work went into that. And also our, our three guests who provided an invaluable insight into their experiences uh, and the hard work that they're doing. Uh, the only dull part of the day was the department, as usual, but that's where we're at. We'll continue holding the account. Yeah, I, th I, th I think the, the committee session today, Daniel has, has made the case very clearly to the department, very, very clearly. Um, for, for full disclosure and clarity, and so as not to exaggerate the nature of my interaction with the Minister last year either, it was actually um, a question raised on the 14th of January, um, AQW 229, forward slash 17 to 22, and I asked the Minister of Education to outline how and when he would introduce legislative guidelines to ensure therapeutic support rather than restraint and seclusion for children and young people. And the answer was that he had asked his officials to consider the issues of restraint and seclusion for children and young people with relevant partners and to report back in due course. Uh, I, I think there's a degree of agreement there that if, if due course, notwithstanding uh, 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 the pandemic is is a year, then then there are there are some problems in place there, particularly when it when it involves uh, incidents of potential harm to children with disabilities. But I Chair, think the committee has made the case clear today, Daniel. Very, very brief final comment from Yeah, well, Chair, it's a positive point, and it shows you who's watching these committee sessions, because Paris Hilton has tweeted you in the last few minutes to 
uh, ensure that there's intervention on behalf of Deirdre Shakespeare and Harry's Law. So it's amazing who's tuning into these committees. I just have seen the tweet. I think I think it demonstrates the the, the importance of the issue, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, okay, members, uh, content to agree those actions agreed. Okay, and obviously um, there is the the all party assembly motion uh, that we have drafted. I've taken a quick glance at the text there, and whilst it could potentially be um, enhanced slightly, I do think it does allow an opportunity for the assembly to debate this issue in more detail, and of course require. Uh, an education ministerial response to the matter as well, which I think is important given um, the extent of the issues that have been raised today. And my hope is that that would be on the order paper uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so education committee members will obviously want to respond to that debate um, uh, should diaries permit. Okay, Clark, we move to agenda item eight, correspondence, and ask you to speak to correspondence. Just on reading, okay. Um, members, correspondence is at uh, page 240. Um, there's a summary note included at page 241, and we have 16 items of correspondence. Item 8.5 um, on page 249 is a response from the department indicating that it doesn't fund the Neuro Nemo program, which is being delivered by the Reverse the Trend Foundation. Um, the programme has a, has a focus on man, managing anxiety around returning to school, encompassing physical and nutritional work. Um, the Education Authority has agreed to offer a staff resource to support the head of the foundation. Um, and Stage 1 of the programme will be offered to all children aged 5 to 16 in Northern Ireland. Uh, the foundation will provide a blended delivery of online worksheets and live sessions, and they'll also provide parent and teacher support resources. Um, members, are you content to forward the response um, to the Reverse the Trend Foundation? Agreed. Agreed. Members, if I, if I could just get you to agree these, these actions, that'd be great. But Clark, can I just um, take us back to item 8.3 very briefly, which w was correspondence um, from special school regards concerns about the vaccination of staff in special schools. I think a number of uh, this committee and a number of members have been seeking constant, constantly seeking update with relation to when special school staff will receive vaccination. And I think Ricky actually himself, um, not last week, but the week before, had said it would be a matter of days. It is now obviously well beyond days. Um, members agreed that we write to the education minister and seek an immediate update with regards to um, the scheduling of vaccinations for special school staff. Yeah, can I add to that, Chair, please? Probably, yes. Yeah, I had a discussion with someone this week, but I think we might be coming with regard to the testing. So um, I know that there were some high-level meetings this week with regard to the testing, so uh, the, the committee would welcome uh, an update on the, the testing in special schools as well. Yeah, okay, so uh, an urgent update in relation to vaccination of special school staff and testing in yeah. special schools. Chair, sure. sure. can I come in again, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. We're, we're okay. We we've, yeah. we've should be okay for time, but try and be as brief as we can in this section. Thanks. I appreciate that this is a very important debate, and I, I also appreciate that there's difficulties in the rollout of the, the, the levels of vaccination, and we'd like to see it. Uh, we're doing very well. We'd like to see it uh, do, do even better, but that's just a, a part of a society. But what I will say bluntly is there's 4,500 staff uh, in the special education league sector. This is not a big ask. It will resolve a lot of problems very quickly. Uh, and I'm very firm in my view that these people should be prioritised uh, very, very quickly. Uh, now, we're now seeing carers vaccinated, just to make a point, Chair, and I'm not against that. Uh, but vaccinated with any form of proof or whatever, uh, and there's a huge number of people that fall under that category. Our debate has always been around these 4,500 individuals that would make a huge difference to ensuring that the most vulnerable children in our society are protected uh, as a result. So I think we need to hammer that point very hard. Again, no criticism at all. I, I entirely appreciate that things are tough, but I do believe that we need to make the strongest possible argument and continue to do so in relation to having the, this category uh, vaccinated. 
yeah, I, I, I think the education committee, including yourself, Daniel, has been absolutely clear on our support for the prioritisation of special school staff for vaccination. Um, and uh, really, regrettably, disappointingly, I, I'm receiving correspondence from special school staff who have who've given up hope on being prioritised. Uh, and it's, 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 you know, it's unacceptable. It's, uh, they're not receiving the support that they need. And, and not only is it, um, you know, creating uh, fear, but it's, it's really demoralizing as well. So I know the minister has been vocally supportive, to be fair to him, of priority vaccination for special school staff. But we need, we need urgent answers as to why that is not taking place then. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Back to you, Clark. Thanks. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just um, scanning around looking for information about vaccination here. Um, uh, there was an update um, at uh, item 8.6 on page uh, 255, just in today's correspondence, um, which does say um, that the Department of Health is currently leading and coordinating the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination programme. The objectives for the current phase of vaccination are the prevention of mortality and the maintenance of the health and social care systems. The Department of Health will work with the department in identifying the cohort of staff who work in special school settings who fit fulfill the criteria, and the criteria are attached to Appendix 1 to that letter. So I don't know if members want to just have a quick scan of that. Um, what page is that on precisely, Clark? 257, uh, 256, and then 257 is the uh, criteria, the set of criteria, um, and you can see there. Um, so, special school staff involved in the direct care of children and young people with the most complex additional healthcare needs, who are clinically vulnerable uh, to severe effects of COVID, may be at higher higher risk of exposure due to their close contact. Um, and then there's a list of not, it's not an exhaustive list, list, but there's a list of clinical interventions which um, are included. Um, I, I think I th so. Yeah, that's two five six and two five seven of your of your PACS members. Like I, I, I think most members um, appreciate that principles need to apply in terms of the prioritisation of vaccines, um, and hence why. Um, this criteria was worked on, but my goodness, it's taken that long to work on, as Daniel has kind of said, would it not have just been quicker to accept that special school staff fit the principles of, um, of, of uh, clinical risk and maintenance of, of health and social care services, given the extent of, of care that does occur um, on special school sites as well. Um, I think members will maybe want to reflect on that, um, but if, at the very least, we need to seek an urgent update as to when this vaccination, however delayed and inadequate it may be, is going to be um, taking place. Members want to add anything at this stage? No. Okay, Clark, is, is that clear enough in terms of correspondence to go back? Sure, and we can forward that item at uh, 8.3, reflecting the specific concerns of that special school. Yeah, is that, it, um, has that criteria for vaccination of staff in special schools been made public, Clark, do we know? Um, I'm not aware, actually, about that. Okay, we'll maybe try and find that out. A conscious time speaking is here as well. Let you let you move on there, Clark, thanks. Okay, um, item 86 on page 254 then is a response from the department um, indicating that the Joint Health and Education Oversight Group has been working with the public health agency to scope a job description to engage someone um, to undertake a vulnerable children and young people partnership framework. Um, and DE has also indicated that it's working with the Department of Health to identify the cohort of staff of, of, uh, to be offered vaccination. So we were getting to the vaccination point just now. Um, okay, okay. So, members, yeah. to know that, yeah. Okay. Agreed. Okay, thanks. 
Thanks. 89 on page 274 is a response from the Mental Health Champion um, setting out proposals for a summer program. So after the committee's evidence session, we asked um, Dr O'Neill to do that. Um, members, uh, I would propose that we forward this to the Education Minister um, and perhaps the other uh, ministers who were suggested might um, share in the work. Do you have any views on this? No, I agreed. Agreed. Members could just keep agreeing those items of correspondence still get through this. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 810 on page 279 um, is a response from DE about payments to invigilators, um, indicating that it was not possible to justify making compensatory payments um, to any exam contractors for work that wasn't delivered. Okay. Um, we and could... Back to the correspondent. Yeah, if we could forward, forward that to the correspondence and, and seek his response to that, that would be helpful. His or her response to that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay. Uh, item 812 on page 287 is correspondence from the department providing a copy of a briefing paper provided to the Committee for the Economy on uh, the 14 to 19 strategy. Um, this was scheduled to be a joint briefing with um, this committee today um, and due, due to the committee's workload, um, they agreed not to take it um, today. Uh, are you content to note the briefing paper? Do you want to reschedule a briefing about this, members? I think, I think we should reschedule the briefing, Clark, if, if members are content. The 14 to 19 strategy is crucially important um, at any time, but particularly at this moment in time. Um, so members can tend to reschedule a, a briefing from officials in relation to the 14 to 19 strategy, agreed? Content, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 813 um, on page 292 is a response from the department confirming that a new teacher's payroll system, um, which will go live in early 2022, will provide all pay slips in electronic format. Um, item 814 on page 295 is correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee included, included, uh, including its forward work programme. Um, members, uh, normally the Public Accounts Committee takes most of the Audit Office reports itself. It has, it has kind of prime bag on those. Um, but an Audit Office report on financial health of schools is available to this committee should it wish. Um, so, members, would you like to take an initial briefing from the Audit Office on this report with a view to making recommendations on the financial health of schools? Yeah, agreed. 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 Okay. Um, item 817 on page 399 is a correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office providing a Hansard report for a briefing it had with the Youth Forum entitled Our Voices Speaking Truth to Power. Um, are members content to note to that, note that, and forward the response um, to the correspondent who raised the matter? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. And are members content to dispose of the other correspondence as per the summary note at page two four one? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks, members. Thanks, members. Agenda item nine is forward work program. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program at page 420 of your packs and remind you that next week um, we are scheduled to hear from the Integrated Education Fund and UNESCO. And the week after that, the Wednesday, the 10th of March, is our engagement with children and young people. And Clark, I believe the Education Minister has confirmed his availability to attend the committee on Wednesday, the 10th of March, in relation to the restart, correct? Yes, he has. So if members want to identify anything further that they will ask him. Okay. There might be an opportunity. Um, members, could I, could I also suggest, uh, given the concerns that have been raised in respect of the General Teaching Council, um, that we would make a, a swap on Wednesday the 24th of March. Um, we would put the, the uh, Department of Education on the General Teaching Council on Wednesday the 24th of March and that we would hear from the department and ETI with regards school inspection then on Wednesday the 21st of April. Would members be content with that slight rescheduling? Content. 
<laughs> Can I go back and check on the children and young people's voices and what um, response we've had from the groups that we've reached out to? Yeah, Clark, could you advise us at this stage who we're looking at in terms of availability for the, the children and young people session? Um, so we have we have spoken with um, Crisis Cafe, uh, Pure Mental, um, the Secondary School Student Union and there's a fourth one. Um, I haven't spoken to the Children's Commissioner yet. I wanted to um, just touch base there and see if that if we could also engage her panel. Um, yeah, uh, there was an Arnie forum, probably the other body, yeah. That's the youth forum, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, because we've got the minister that day now, we, we will have um, a limited time to speak to those groups. It's a, That day is a 9.30 to 1.30 session, so we do have the, the full uh, time. And I would propose that our children and young persons session is, is taken as one evidence session. Um, and then the other evidence session would be with the education minister. Um, is that a member's content with that approach? I, I, I think we reserve the possibility of doing a, a full stakeholder engagement um, with with a wider group of children and young people if, if we believe that's uh, helpful. Um, but th this is to try and take some of those uh, key umbrella bodies at a, at a really important moment for education with school restart uh, being explored and um, exams and assessments still in the mix as well. Mental health recovery, educational, physical activity all in the mix as well. So members members content with that forward work program approach? Yep, content. Yep. Okay. Um, and I, I hope the executive is given serious consideration to how they restart physical activity um, as well as uh, as well as school restart. Um, that's really important. Okay, uh, members, any other business? Sure. Yes, Justin. I just I think there's the school leaders come on to me confused about what's happening at the executive at the top of the executive world. One first minister is saying schools are open on this date. One first minister is saying they're going to be open on that date. School leaders, teachers, pupils, parents, they all have a head in their hands saying, what the hell is going on? We need some clarity. We need some consistency. We need some certainty. Chair, can I come uh, in? No good yeah. surprise. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let, let, let's stay orderly. Can't, can't disagree with that, Justin. I think we're all receiving that card for once. I'll bring in Pat, and then I'll bring in Daniel as well. I'm going to need to close up soon. Sure. I think to say there's mixed message in the stretching of it, but I mean, Arlene went on a solo run uh, the other night after an agreement in the executive last week. I mean, let's, let's put the blame where it deserves that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean to, bring, yeah, to, to, bring, to bring it back, um, obviously the executive met on Thursday, the 18th last week, and it, and it made announcements. And there were, there was, I think there were quick questions arose in terms of the rationale for um, particular year groups coming back at particular times and others. But at least it, it, was, a, it was a decision and it was a roadmap. Um, I think the Education Minister ought to have given an oral statement to allow members to ask some of those questions regards why a particular approach had been um, taken and they allow them to respond. But it, it was, an, as, as Pat alludes to, my understanding is it was an exe agreed executive approach at that stage. I don't think ministry by media thereafter is helpful. Um, as you've alluded to, Justin, it has caused confusion. It has caused stress. Um, my understanding is there is an executive meeting tomorrow, and, and hopefully we can get back to um, a coherent um, approach um, without any particular minister um, briefing by media instead. I don't think it's helpful, and it, it does cause confusion and distress. Dan, yeah. did you want to come in finally before we, before we close? Well, uh, it's a typical symptom of this and <laughs> of, of, of the DUP's behaviour. You know, uh, as soon as Boris Johnson pops his head up like a rabbit, the DUP come running and, and do the exact same thing. We're, we're in an entirely different situation and everything needs to be based on the health and scientific advice as instructed and as the majority of us have followed. It, it, it is unhelpful for the First Minister to do it. We all appreciate the children 
uh, our best placed in school. But equally, we have said for the best part of the year now, the school environment needs to be safe. And even yet, the Minister for Education Care has not hired a single extra teacher, has put an extra bus on the road, has done anything to ensure that the classroom environment or other ways is safe. But yet, now that Boris Johnson is opening schools, he wants to every child to return without any precautions or measures put in place. That's not going to happen. Uh, and I think this committee is quite united in, that, in, in relation to that. A, a phased return of school uh, children is the right approach because it will ensure that we can keep a close eye on the R rate. We don't want to spike after the huge amount of work and sacrifices went in to get us to this stage. But uh, as yeah. most people do now, they ignore Minister O'Year uh, 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 and if Arlene keeps coming out with these uh, loose statements, they'll be soon ignoring her as well. And the Education Committee did, uh, did, did of course, attempt to invite uh, the CMO and CSA to our committee to, to engage with the, the scientific evidence around Safe School Restart as well. So we, we, we have made that attempt. Uh, members, uh, I'm advised that during the meeting um, we've been given notice um, of the Minister for Education's intention of publishing a, a written statement. Um, rather than an oral statement. Uh, Clark, have we been given a time scale for that? Um, that's the 24 hours notice, so it'll be um, on the 25th of February tomorrow. tomorrow. Written statement will be made. Uh, okay, members. Um, and we obviously have other uh, avenues available to us to try and seek greater clarity in relation to that. Um, the Minister has confirmed his attendance with us on the, the 10th of March. Any, any other business? No? Okay, members. Uh, a, a sincere thanks for your your participation and contribution today. Uh, I think that was a, an extremely important um, session of the Education Committee on, on an issue that we have sought to prioritise and that we will continue to um, hold the department to account on and endeavour to contribute to constructively. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, the date and time of our next meeting then is next Wednesday, the third of March. At, at the earlier time of, of 9 a.m., if you note that. Thank you, members. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.